here on public hearing on, sit, we're a little late, 755, public hearing on motor vehicle ordinance. October 1st, 2018, uh, public hearing ground rules. A public hearing has been scheduled to, to allow interested citizens an opportunity to express their opinions regarding amendment of Chapter 38, Article 5, Sections 38-141 through 38-145, inclusive, abandoned, and operable unregistered motor vehicles and unsightly materials of the Enfield Town Code. Item number one, roll call, please. Councillor Anoni. Here. Councillor Bosco. Here. Councillor Sakala. Here. Councillor Crisati. Here. Councillor Davis. Here. Councillor Denny. Here. Councillor Falk. Mayor Ludwig. Here. Councillor Muller. Here. Deputy Mayor Suzak. Here. Councillor Ungeyer. There's 10 members present, one is absent. The following notice of public hearing was published in the Hartford Current, Friday, September 21st, 2018. Town of Enfield Legal Notice Public Hearing. The Enfield Town Council will hold a public hearing in the Enfield Town, Town Hall. Council Chambers, 820 Enfield Street, Enfield, Connecticut, on Monday, October 1st, 2018, at 6.30 p.m., to allow interested citizens an opportunity to express their opinions regarding the amendment of Chapter 38, Article 5, Sections 38-141 through 38-145, inclusive, abandoned, and operable unregistered motor vehicles and unsightly materials of the Enf materials of the Enfield Town Code. The proposals are available for review in the Office of the Town Clerk, Susanna Nicky, Town Clerk, stated September, dated September 18, 2018. General ground rules for the public hearing. There is no time limit, but I ask each person not to take up too much time so everyone will have an opportunity to speak. After each person who desires has one chance to speak, we shall permit those individuals who desire a second chance. After those individuals desire a second time, we shall permit those individuals desire a third, fourth, etc. Please refrain from personalities. Again, this public hearing is to talk about the, the uh, specific ordinance to, to the motor vehicles. Uh, unfortunately, if you want to speak about something else, you have to wait to the general meeting, which will happen after this public hearing. So having said that, anyone would like to speak specifically on this public hearing? Mr. Slade. Welcome, sir. Just name and address for the record, please. Slade, Tim Slade, Brewster Road. This light means it's on. Is it? You got it. Yes, sir. Go ahead. <clears throat> Uh, working with two devices here, so <laughs> bear with me. Uh, and looking over, in looking over the re revision, the proposed revision, I have numerous comments. Mr. Slate, I'm sorry. Is the light that the light's on? Is it? Okay. Maybe move the mic. Yeah. If you want to mind, Mike. We want to make sure we hear you, sir. Go right ahead. Perfect. Sorry. Thank you. Okay. Mm. But it talks about an inoperable motor vehicle. I'm just curious. Oh, sorry. Thought it was on. <laughs> <laughs> You're done then, right? Your, your work is done here. <laughs> no, I, yeah, I got over this obstacle. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> Take your time. Sorry about that. How's it? How are they going to determine whether it's operable or not? Uh, no, he's not about to. He's you know, go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead, go ahead, sir. Uh, you know, my question is, how, how is it determined that it's going to be operable? Um, I mean, it, if it's if it runs, but the transmission shot, uh, it, you know, who's going to do that? Is that going to be EPD? Uh, I don't know. Um, does a motor vehicle include vehicles that are inoperable, but stored on a farm on farmland or alleged farmland? We, we have some areas in town that used to be farms. They're not really farms anymore, but they have numerous vehicles and equipment there. Um, this revision contains the same restrictions as the Housing Code Ordinance, Article 3, Section 14-172, with respect to unsightly materials and junk. Why are there two departments doing the same thing? That doesn't make any sense to me. So if you want to report a concern, who do you go to? EPD or you go to uh, zoning? Um, the paragraph defining an unsightly motor vehicle uses vague and amb ambiguous terms such as damaged and vandalized. 
This could mean a dented door or fender that's damaged. Could that be considered an unsightly motor vehicle? Um, has nothing to do with whether it's operable or registered. Section 38-143 refers to a vehicle that has been removed pursuant to this ordinance, yet there is nothing in the ordinance about removing a vehicle. The, the old ordinance talked about, um, after so many uh, citations, that the town could remove the vehicle. This revision doesn't address that, but it talks about removing a vehicle. <clears throat> um, what is the amount of time a violation has been determined and a motor vehicle must be covered? Now, I, I'm, I'm going to be honest with you, this has been a sticking point for me since this ordinance was enacted in 2002. EPD never, to my knowledge, enforced that portion of the ordinance. Never. Uh, we can't pick and choose what we're going to do here. It, that's just not the way it's supposed to work. So I'm just wondering how long does it, is it on the revision, you're giving the owner, the real property owner, 30 days plus 10, which is another subject I got to ask about. Um, but when does that vehicle have to be covered? And by the way, it's, it's uh, if you look at the ordinance, it specifically states it has to be a cover intended for a vehicle, not a tarp. Um, the, the ordinance, both of them talks, the, the original and the revision, they talk about being, the vehicle being in view. Does the entire vehicle have to be in view? Or can a portion of that vehicle be in view? I ask that question because I know of a, of a property who the vehicle, there's two vehicles, they're parked in the back, they're partially visible. And... Uh, Section 38-144 calls for a maximum of two infractions. They have a first infraction that costs, that'll cost you 90 bucks. Second infraction, I presume, will cost you another 90 bucks. That's 180 bucks. Um, some people, that's not an issue. Depends on what they have parked there. So what happens after the second fraction is issued? The ordinance doesn't say. <clears throat> it just says you can only give two and you're done. So somebody who really wants to hang on to a vehicle because they're restoring it, uh, they're waiting, I don't know, for income tax check, whatever. Um, you know, 180 bucks may, may not be a big deal. So they paid her 180 bucks and it's all over with. Um, there's no mention of anything after the second infraction. So... Um, I, I would like to say that EPD has not, they've never wanted to enforce this ordinance to begin with. When this ordinance was first presented, I had a police lieutenant standing in my driveway telling me he was not going to uh, issue a citation to a property owner because he didn't know where the property line was. He didn't know what that meant. Took me 15 minutes to call the zoning enforcement officer to find out. But this guy was adamant he wasn't going to do it because he didn't know. So uh, that, that kind of discourages people <laughs> from, uh, you know, from, from submitting this. And <clears throat> abandoned, inoperable, unregistered motor vehicles are an issue in this town. Um, Oh, one more question. Suppose this vehicle, and I have a specific vehicle in mind, <clears throat> and I, I believe Councilor Swizak is aware of it, South Road 190. It may be sitting on town property. How is that handled? Because the ordinance talks about real property, which would one would presume is, is owned by an individual. Um, that vehicle has been sitting there for years. No one's ever said anything, apparently. But uh, what, do, what do you do if it's on town property? Can you tow it? You know, can, can you give the property owner that's adjacent, can you give them a, a, a citation? This ordinance, the old one and new one, seems to deal with real property only. It doesn't say anything about town property. So that may be something that you may want to look at 
before you pass the ordinance. Maybe have something put in. But uh, I'm, I'd really be interested in knowing um, why why the unsightly uh, or, or the, uh, the the blight is with two departments. Oh, and the other thing: Are there any liens that are placed? The new revision mentions no liens. The old revision does, and I don't know if what was put on the town website is the entire ordinance or just the portion that's going to be revised. I don't know. But the old ordinance had um, uh, liens. You could put liens on the real property that, that the vehicle belonged to. And uh, this revision does not. So, sorry. I didn't turn my volume down. <laughs> <All right. laughs> so uh, it, it, that's confusing to me. Uh, like I said, the new revision only calls for two citations, 180 bucks, and we're done. I got my car, or whatever it is, and uh, I'm all set. 180 bucks. You know. And the other thing is, is uh, I, I don't know how many service men and women we have deployed in this town, but there's a potential for um, which brings up another subject. There's a potential for a vehicle that may, the, the registration may run out. <clears throat> They're deployed. What are we going to do about them? I mean, I'd hate to see, you know, somebody be get cited because they're deployed overseas. That's just cruel. Um, oh, what was the other item? I can't remember now. But um, I, I think there's some more work that needs to be done on this ordinance before you pass it. Yeah. And, and I would like to see um, some real enforcement as opposed to what's been done in the past, because what's been done in the past is pitiful, as far as I'm concerned. <clears throat> EPDs come up with more reasons why not to. I mean, one of the items that, put, that was put in there, which was excellent, two, three years ago, um, they refused to enforce a um, an abandoned vehicle. It was a boat and a trailer because it had a fence up around it, and someone said well black's law library says that a fence is an enclosure the ordinance says it's an enclosure so i'm not going to enforce it well wait a minute it's a chain link fence i can see it that the spirit of the ordinance is you can see it they wouldn't wouldn't enforce it um it, it, it's just not right i mean you got to work to the spirit of the ordinance so i'm just saying um maybe you need to somebody needs to take a look at it I mean, it's great that they made the changes, some of the changes that they made, because it, it allows more flexibility. But there is more, I think, that needs to be done. That's it. Thank you, Mr. Slade. Appreciate it. Anyone else like to speak specifically on this ordinance? Gretchen. Welcome. Thank you. Gretchen Pfeiffer Hall for Summers Road Enfield. Um, so I just want to speak in favor of anything you can do to strengthen this ordinance. Um, I have a property that my husband and I own at 265 Hazard Avenue in, in Hazardville. And um, our, our neighbor has uh, an unregistered vehicle, which I think is the very description of what is is not allowed and I have brought um, some photographs of, of my property as well as the the offending vehicle and um, the, the view that that my property has of this we have considered um, installing a fence to to block the view of this vehicle but unfortunately that would um, be a problem for our snowplow people because our driveways are are right next to each other and this this vehicle um, it is behind the uh, building line but it is within the 25 foot side yard um, setback so we have worked really hard to improve 
the looks of, of our building and it's really very disturbing to have to, to look at this. So um, my family has owned this building for at least for approximately 30 years. <coughs> it's been a real estate office. Um, so my husband and I bought it about six years ago and we rented it to another real estate office which has um, grown and, and relocated. So now I have a, a vacant building which I need to decide what to do. But regardless of whether I want to sell it or lease it, I have this situation next door. So as a realtor, I can tell you that this doesn't help anybody's property values. Um, theirs, mine, anybody nearby. Um, so I also have a map of the, so we're zoned business local, they're zoned residential, and um, have the um, requirements for the setbacks for you to look at. May I bring it to you? Sure. Are you guys bring or, it to Chris, right? Or can, yeah, no. no, I you just want, I think, right? Can she, yes. Can, yep. Great question. Yep. So, and I just wanted to mention, I'll um, pass it yep. perhaps just instead of bifurcating the matter and keeping it together so everybody has a recollection of what the questions were, Sergeant Meyer is here, so I'd rather have him come up when the public is done speaking. He could just come up and then um, answer any of the questions that he's able to that have been posed so far so we keep it together and then when it comes up on the agenda later you'll be in a position to vote on it. So I did do the C-click fix thing um, with, with a photograph probably this this vehicle has been sitting there I'm not sure how long since certainly over the summer months and um, nothing happened so I don't know why um, but so you can see a picture of it when you go in the back door is basically the front door and um, it's just it's sitting there you pull in the driveway and and you have to see this thing and it's gotten progressively worse over the summer they seem to be cannibalizing it I don't know it's just getting worse so um, anything that can be done to assist um, myself and, and anybody else who's has to live next to this or own property or lease um, would be much appreciated. Thank you. Anyone else like to speak on this public hearing? Sir. Hi, Welcome. everybody. Thanks for all coming in tonight. And Just uh, name and address. I'm Neil Narcon from 5 Clear Street. That's N-A-R-K-O-N. I looked over the proposals here and everything else, and I agree with the first speaker here that this thing definitely needs more time and consideration working into it here because it definitely involves a lot. You know, I like cars myself. I'm a hobbyist, too, and I, I don't want to see anything restrictive to people like myself who like doing that. And uh, at the same time, you want to keep clean, neat appearance for everybody around you, too. I understand that as well. But there's some definitions here that probably need more clarification, you know, under the definitions here. And I assume the new, the bold print in this document means additional verbiage. Am I not on that? Am I correct in that assumption? Yes. For example, the uh, third line down building line means a parallel to the street. You know, is that a, a new entry to this document? I can't tell. But anyway, some of this needs to be clarified, especially unslightly. I mean, that's very, very subjective, you know, for, for who's ever trying to define that. You know, somebody likes Buicks and somebody doesn't like Fords. I mean, Fords are no good, you know. So we need to, we need to define that a little better. Definition of inoperative and who determines that and what stage. You know, if I got a car up that's uh, in winter storage where the gas is draining batteries out of it and that's all it takes to restore it and make it running, am I okay? Am I not okay? Um, the other thing, too, is this document is merging some other disciplines as well, you know, as far as the blight stuff and talking about their materials and things around the house and things like that. I don't know, but that doesn't belong here. If we're talking about automobiles and stuff, keep it, keep it simple, keep it straight, because I think it's clouding the issue a little bit. Just keep, over, you know, keep it just autos there and don't overlap it with other disciplines. Yeah, what else here? 
the title itself, abandoned, unsightly, inoperative, unregistered motor vehicles, and unsightly materials. Sounds kind of depressing. Maybe somebody can come up with a better title for this document. Um, and I think that's about it. Anyway, work on it some more. I wouldn't jump into this and pass it too quick, because I mean, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be very effective here. And uh, you don't want to do something that, that's going to be uh, not effective down the road. OK. Thanks for your time, everyone. Thank you. Appreciate it. Anyone else would like to speak on this public hearing? Yes, sir. Welcome. Hi. How are you doing? Uh, I'm doing well, thank you. Uh, Michael Barrett, 31 North Maple Street. Um, I think whatever you guys can do to strengthen, um, you know, the law here to get abandoned vehicles and vehicles that are never going to be used or have just been sitting there um, out of the yards would be great. Um, I have a neighbor who has a couple of boats, a couple of trailers, a couple of cars, um, big step um, van. The step van's been sitting in his yard for probably 25 or 30 years and just hasn't been used, used for storage. Um, you know, they, they just sit there and rot, and uh, I don't know if they'll ever be used or, or, or not. I mean, most of them haven't been. And, um, you know, uh, I just want something a little tougher so it can be enforced because this isn't something that uh, is new to me. You know, I've been complaining about it for probably 30 years, and nothing has ever been done about it, you know. So uh, I really would like something with little teeth in it so when you go out and say, you got to do this, that it gets done, okay? And, again, if someone's fixing a car or working on it, you know, that's one thing. But just to have it sit there thinking you're going to be working on it at some point in time um, and never doing it is something completely different. And also, um, you know, they should be parked back and, and way away from the road, and so you can't see them and so forth. And um, a lot of these are they are all over the yard. Um, and we had another house across the street that got cleaned up um, as well, um, and they had things like that sitting in the backyard. They had a mobile home, a trailer, you know, other things, and uh, the house finally sold, so they had to clean that one up, which was very nice. Um, but uh, I would like something with uh, a little more authority in it so that you can actually get some, some things done and people will listen to you and do it uh, when you tell them. That's all. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else like to speak on this public hearing? Anyone else like to speak on this public hearing? For, for, for the first time? No? Sorry, go ahead, Gretchen. Yep, second time. Yep. Just want to make sure. Sorry about that. It's okay. Forgot me already. <laughs> <coughs> Gretchen Clay for Hall of Course Summers Road again. Um, so just listening to some of the other people, um, I have not, I'm not an attorney and I haven't reviewed this as carefully as apparently some other people have, but um, certainly do want some teeth in this, but I don't want you to take your time because I've been waiting long enough and it sounds like the last speaker has been waiting way longer enough. So um, the sooner you can get this done, the better. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Anyone else like to speak and specifically for the second time in this public hearing? Going once, going twice, declare the public hearing closed. And we move on. I'm sorry we're late, 720, so we're going to move right on to the regular meeting, Monday, October 1st, 2018. Uh, prayer, Councillor Suzak, please rise. I guess today on the radio is the one year anniversary of the shooting in Las Vegas. And personally, I've had enough bad news and I like everybody just take a moment of silence and instead of thinking of something that that's bad that you can make better why don't you concentrate on something that makes your life better and sharing that with other people thank you pledge pledge allegiance to the flag of the united states of america and to the republic for which it stands one nation under god Indivisible, indivisible, liberty, liberty and, justice and justice for all. <laughs> item, item number three, roll call, please. Here. Here. 
Here. Here. Here. Here. Here. Here. Here. Here. Here. Item number four, fire evacuation. In case of a fire, please exit orderly. We have an exit in the back of the building. You can go right or left out the door, or you can go to our, the doors to our left, your right. Get orderly out the door would be your first doors to your, to your left. Go down the stairs and out the doors to the parking lot. Item number six, minutes of preceding meetings. Um, first, special meeting September 17, 2018. Do you have a motion to approve? By Councilor Muller. Second. Seconded by Councilor Denny. Is there any discussion on the motion? Hearing on by a show of hands, all those in favor? Opposed, any abstentions? We have one abstention and one, so it would be one, yeah, nine appro approved. Nine in favor. Uh, regular meeting, September 17, 2018. Do I have a motion to approve? Okay. Councilor Muller, seconded by Councilor Crisati. Any discussion on the motion? Hearing on by a show of hands, all those in favor? Those opposed, any abstentions? We have eight in favor, two abstentions. Item number six, special guests. First item on a special guest, Corona's Market. We are uh, 100, year, 100 years in business and we have a proclamation and also some folks from the state who are gonna give them a uh, certificate from the state. So if we could call up folks from Corona's Marketplace. You guys wanna come around? Want to go first? Does that make sense? Congratulations. We're going to call up the folks from the state. They have a pro uh, proclamation from the state of Connecticut, and then we'll do the proclamation from the town, and you'll have the mic all to yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for inviting us here tonight. Um, I'll hand the microphone over to Greg so he can read the citation, the state citation. All right, we congratulate you on uh, the 100 years, you and all the folks there. I don't think any of us here were there at the original opening, but uh, uh, we congratulate you. From the state of Connecticut, the General Assembly, the official citation introduced uh, by Representative Greg Stokes, myself, Representative Carol Hall, the 59th District, uh, State Senator John Kissel from the 7th Senatorial District, be it hereby known to all that the Connecticut General Assembly hereby offers its sincerest congratulations to Corona Supermarket uh, in recognition of your 100th year of providing quality local products and tremendous friendly, friendly service to the infield community and wishing you uh, many more years of a continued success. The entire membership extends its best wishes in, on this uh, memorable occasion and expresses the hope of continued uh, success. Given this day, October 1st, 2018, at the State Capitol, Hartford, Connecticut, and is signed by the President Pro Tem, Martin Looney, Speaker of the House, uh, Joe uh, Arasimowitz, and uh, Secretary of State, uh, uh, Denise Merrill. We congratulate you on this year. We want to give this to you there, so. This is a proclamation, proclamation recognizing Corona's market on their 100th year anniversary. All 100 years in Thompsonville, too, as well, which is very impressive. Mm -hmm. Whereas Corona's market has been an integral part of Enfield history for generations, beginning when it was incorporated in 1918 by Severio Corona at 46 North Main Street in Enfield's Thompsonville section of town. And whereas Corona's has remained a family establishment with ownership passing to Frank Corona, then to Anthony Corona, with all the employees consistently being members of the family, and whereas Corona's established a solid reputation from the time that the mills were active in Thompsonville and, was and, and Thompson was the town's shopping center through its move to the current location at 25 Pearl Street in 1962. And whereas Corona's makes an important co contribution to our holistic community through their tradition and financial investments by serving an anchor as an anchor for commercial development and a hub for necessary neighborhood services. And whereas Corona's has set the standard for high quality meats, grocery products, and affordable essentials guaranteeing that residents have the access to healthy food, and whereas Corona's is a family grocery store, plays a crucial role in our community, 
providing a vital source of nutrition, tax revenue that support the community. Community generates food, foot traffic for the surrounding area and features familiar faces. Now, therefore, I, Michael Ludwig, Mayor of the Town of Enfield, on behalf of the Town Council, the Town Administration, the entire Enfield community, recognize Corona's Market on their 100th year anniversary and extend our appreciation to the whole Corona family for their service as a staple of our community. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you very much. We, we're honored here to uh, rep to honor Coronas. Again, 100 years in our town and in Thomasville is a great achievement. We hope you have another 100 years. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very, Thank very you. Much. <coughs> <laughs> uh, special guest, Sheila Grady, Senior Center Director. Welcome. Thank you. Along with Jason, you folks have the floor. Thank you. Welcome, so Jason. Welcome, Sheila. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. So we're thrilled to have Sheila on board. Um, we had uh, quite a few applicants for this position, uh, over 50 all said and done. We interviewed uh, six different people that really met the qualifications. And Sheila really stood out above the rest. Um, she comes to us from the town of Ashford. She was the uh, senior center director there for a number of years. Uh, prior to that, she worked at uh, Goodwill Industries and um, I think I'm missing Meals one here. on Wheels. Meals on Wheels. That was it. Meals, on, Meals on Wheels program. Yep. <laughs> um, so she comes with a lot of experience working with with uh, senior citizens, and I think she's going to be a, a, a great fit. She's got some good ideas. Uh, she's got a lot of experience with uh, programming, fitness classes, wellness classes, um, and I also want to say uh, what a great job the, the the crew at the senior center did with this transition. Nancy Dara, uh, Sue Roche, uh, Irene G and Petro. Um, they've been really pivotal in getting us to where we are right now, and uh, Mary Keller has done a, a great job getting Sheila up to speed on everything. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's been great. Um, uh, another thing I wanted to mention was we had done a survey uh, of the Senior Center users uh, regarding the, the hours that we've been operating. Um, it came to, we, we asked three simple questions. We wanted to really get straight to the, the point. The first one was, have you or do you plan to use Saturday hours? And about 79% of the respondents said that they had not and weren't really planning on it. 20% uh, said that they, they do or would like to. Um, would folks prefer an additional evening instead of Saturdays? Uh, again, it was about 75% said that they would prefer that to the, um, to the Saturdays. And then we asked which available day, which was Monday or Wednesday, and uh, folks leaned toward the Wednesdays. So the Saturdays have not been um, very well utilized up to this point. We've been averaging about 15 folks per day. Uh, the last Saturday we had nine people come in. Um, we tried to run some of our fitness classes on there, which are revenue producers. We tried to run uh, Zumba, yoga, and um, a weight program we did not get up to that minimum level where we were going to at least break even, which is sort of our, 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 our floor for, for running a class. So we are missing some potential revenue by not running the evening classes where we have traditionally brought in quite a bit with the, the, uh, the evening classes. In talking to a lot of the seniors on sort of one-on-one -on -one basis and also in meetings with uh, the advisory board, uh, the Friends of the Senior Center, Commission on Aging, a lot of the working seniors um, that are sort of on that younger end, that 50 to 65 age range, they really have traditionally used the, the center in the evenings. That's when they can get in there. Um, the weekends, I keep hearing over and over, it's time for family. Uh, they've got prior commitments. So uh, moving forward, I think this is really something we need to take a hard look at as to whether or not we want <coughs> to continue pursuing the Saturdays versus the evening. Um, I, I've certainly heard that the feedback is people prefer the evenings. So I wanted to kind of leave you guys with that. Sheila, I don't know if you have anything since, you know. I'd just like to say one thing that um, just I want to thank you guys for the opportunity to work within the town of Enfield. And I just hope that I can make your senior center an inviting and welcome place for all the people who utilize it. So that's really my, my goal. And 
with the Saturday thing, I mean, just looking at the demographics. And I think if you look at the 50, the, um, as they call the baby boomers coming in that Jason was talking about with the, with the younger seniors, um, that they do utilize it more at night than on Saturdays because they do mark that as family time. So just to keep that in mind okay. of that huge demographic coming up. Anyone have any questions for Sheila or Jason? Councilor no? Not as many questions, but just the, the hours, and that's what we heard. Um, you know, we had many people here come here and testify about the hours. Um, we've been dealing with issues now for about a year, and I've already heard great things. Oh, so wonderful. So welcome aboard. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Keep up the good work. Thank you. And, um, I, you know, I think uh, the people have spoken on that, and that's uh, I was in favor of having more of those, uh, um, you know, uh, studies and, and uh, questionnaires to the to see what they like. So we always keep fresh and keep what's needed. And, uh, you know, the working seniors, uh, they came out and they said that's why they like the nights, because the weekends are with their family. So, um, uh, yeah, you get my uh, full support on that. So thank you very much. Good job. <laughs> nice to see you. Thanks, Mary. Councilor Denny. Yeah, just congratulations and uh, thank you. welcome. I'll be around to visit you. Okay, that's, that was what I was going to say. And you're welcome to stop by and come by and visit and introduce yourself. <laughs> Councilor Ungar, then Councilor Crisati. I just wanted to thank you for coming in and introducing yourself and welcome. And I look forward thank to working you. with you. Thank you. Councilor Crisati. Yeah. Uh, welcome to uh, the town of Enfield. Uh, thank you so much. Welcome to addition, working with the Commission on Aging and, and the. Uh, the research that has been done with the senior center hours, um, I am totally in agreement that the Saturday hours are the time for which a lot of people express time to be with their families, they have family activities, and the increase of the, the night hours. So you guys did a real lot of work on that. So I just want to congratulate you on your, your research, Mary and Jason, and once again, uh, Sheila, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Scala. Just briefly, welcome, welcome aboard. Um, I, I sort of echoing everything everybody else says. Let's not just keep it in mind. If they want these the evening hours, let's let's get them back. So let's just make it happen. Uh, and Councilor, I'm sorry, Councilor <coughs> Mayor Sakala. I mean, uh, Suzak, sorry. I, I okay, just, second time it did to me. You know, <laughs> you know. So you, you when you go right after <laughs> when, it, when she goes right after you, that's what it is. Yeah. I know. Those difficult names. Yeah. They have those double I'm saying the names correctly. <laughs> I'm saying the names correctly, at least. I, I guess for me, I think, you know, we, we tried Saturday hours, but we tried it in the summer. And the summer is, you know, traditionally it's light at night. And I think that, you know, for me, Saturday might be a better fit for winters. A lot of places get rid of their Saturday hours in the summer. And then I'm reading the paper on Saturday, and I, lo and behold, the JI does not even advertise the Saturday hours. I'm, I had to read it three times, and I'm like, well. <laughs> I'm not sure why it wasn't in the JI. The, the front and center I, newsletter and, and the, the weekly it. columns, um, yeah. it, it has been out there. It's been on the website. Um, and also, do we stress that you can be 50 and older? Because I think yeah. a lot of people don't realize that, because guess what? At 50, we don't realize we're old. <laughs> I was um, I was there on um, maybe last Wednesday or the Wednesday before speaking to the Enfield senior singles who meet there on Wednesday evenings, and there was I, I believe it was a Zumba class going on, and a lot of the folks there were in that that 50 age range. I mean the 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 one um, is someone who's on the library board, so I know her well, and you know so it yeah I, I think it is it, it is out there. I think maybe sometimes people are. are maybe a little reluctant to come in um but uh where i think the what you see in the very early morning hours is very different from the evening hours i think it's two very distinct demographics and i just to add one thing um i think also by instilling these programs at night where they these are the seniors that are going to be coming in when they retire so to kind of go towards their demographic and the hours that they want will help us down the line when they become retired and they're going to use the center more often. Okay. Okay, I'm still, I'm a little stubborn, so I want to give Saturday hours a little more time. And I agree, I think it should be published in the paper. And maybe in the paper you say, you know, ages X above X are welcome. Sure. I mean, 
That, I mean, because that was the whole point of doing it was to try to grow more people to use the building. Right. You know, yeah. people who aren't within the you know kind of sphere of who go to the website, who do. Mm -hmm. and again, let people. I can tell you, I know a lot of people, fifty year old, don't know they can use a senior center. Sure. Yeah. There's no doubt about it. So I'm just saying, I think would, if we could advertise it when we put it out in the paper, if it doesn't work in a month, I'll be more than willing yeah. to take your recommendation. The the other thing, especially geared toward attracting that younger demographic, is um, there's a number of insurance reimbursements out right. there, for, specifically for the fitness center. Right. Right. And a lot of those, like the Silver Sneakers program, is geared 65 and older. Right. But there is a, a lower rung. Every, every work in person has it, basically. Exactly. Yep. Yep. And so that's another thing that we're looking at to try to, to bring in those folks. Yeah. Right. Councilor Bosco. Well, touching on something you just said, are we opening too early on Saturday? I, I don't, uh, on Saturday? Um, you know, if, if people don't go to the senior center till the later hours, even during the day for the most part, maybe we're checking the wrong time on Saturday. You know, Saturday morning, people are getting up, getting things going. You know, maybe really we should be looking at opening up later on Saturday and now these people are get their stuff that they need to do before noontime done, and now they'll have time to go. Something we could look at. Um, you know, certainly during the week, 8 o'clock, we've got folks ready to come in. Um, maybe Saturdays are different. Right, that, that's what I'm that's saying. Awesome. You know, Saturday is completely different. So, you know, the, the idea was to get the younger people and get mm -hmm. different people yeah. going into it. Yeah. And, um, you know, everything needs tweaking sometimes. Sure. but. Sure. It's just a shame to th even think about maybe getting rid of something until we finally really figure out what what it will make it tick, what will make it work. Because right. that was the whole intent is to get more people to come sure. that really don't come. And I know me, I could never show up during a week because I work all day. Right. And you know, by the time I get out of work, you know, you're tired or you got things. But maybe a Saturday afternoon, I could probably go. Right. Um, I, I will say we have lost a lot of that demographic that, that had been using it in the evenings. I think that, I mean, I wasn't there beforehand, so I don't know what the attendance numbers were. But anecdotally, I can say that, you know, folks have been, uh, that, that particular demographic has been less well represented anecdotally. Do we have something on a door so we can really see what the, so, what the, what? and when the people use it, you know, like something similar to the library. Right, that's one of the things we're working with, with the, uh, the Friends of the Senior Center, actually. Um, I met with them last month and they approved the purchase of um, a new touchscreen computer for the check-in station, which had not been functioning correctly. It was just delivered today. So uh, working with IT to get that put in, we're very excited about that. I also mentioned to the Friends of the Senior Center the uh, possibility of putting door counters in like we do have at the library. So at the next meeting, which is uh, middle of uh, October, I'm going to present to them um, proposals for door counters on both the main entrance and the side entrance, which are the two main egresses to the building. And I think we'll be able to get a, a more accurate count of the daily use that way because we're missing a lot. Well, seeing as I'm too young to use a senior center. <laughs> <laughs> Can we see your driver's license? <laughs> uh, I, I don't know. Do they have to sign in on that touch screen when they come it's in? It's encouraged. Um, and uh, specifically for that, the insurance reimbursement that I had spoken about, that's one of the ways that we can track that. So we do encourage folks to use that sign-in station. Um, but if I decided I wanted to go, I wouldn't have to. You wouldn't necessarily have to. So that's not really a clear indicator on how many people. Which is why what I'd like to do is get the, the door counter, deduct the sign-ins from that number, and then we're going to have a true accurate number as to how many people are coming in and using the facility. I'd be more comfortable after we get a door counter and maybe thinking about changing some hours there to maybe reflect a different time. But right now, I, I want to give it a good, honest shot because I, I think that it could really work. And, uh, you know, the more people we can get there, then if, if for some reason it doesn't go, I'm j the only thing I'm a little hesitant on is I, I'm, I'm a pig-headed person. So if I want something... I'll go without just so I can get what I want. Sure. So, you know, if I if I was doing a senior center and I didn't want Saturday hours, I wouldn't show up on Wednesday for, for three months, even if I wanted to go, just so it would show that I wasn't there on Saturday. Right. You know, so 
you know, I don't know how much of that's being done, too, because I know I'd do it. Well, I, I do know that the Wednesday evenings when we do run classes, they, they fill up. And, you know, we're bringing in revenue on those Wednesday nights for those classes that we're, that we're running. So I don't think there's a necessarily a boycott. I think that it's just the days that folks are looking for. Thank you. Sure. Yep. Thank you. Councilor Miller. Okay, because I know my mother-in-law right now is throwing stuff at the TV. Because we, <laughs> we cut hours to include hours on Saturday. I don't have a problem with Saturdays, but if we're going to step up to the plate, we have to fund it. We can't cut... Uh, uh, two nights out to fund the Saturday, Joe. That's that's all I'm saying. And I believe, true, maybe the afternoons are the way to go, but we got to put up a shut up. And we can't cut hours to increase hours on an end where nobody's going to be there. And that's my issue with this. And yes. I'm on my mother in law's good side now. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing that I do want to throw out is. Um, we're looking at extending the day until five o'clock, which I think will help to a, a smaller degree. And we're going to do that by staggering shifts once we are fully staffed. We're still looking for a secretary. So when we bring that secretary on board, we'll have her work that nine to five instead of the eight to four. So that'll, that'll get us an extra hour, which I think will go a long ways, as well as the Fridays. We've been closing at one o'clock and we're going to, once we're fully staffed, get up to that uh, staying open till five. Well, welcome and thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Welcome. Look thank forward you. to working with you. <laughs> Item number seven, public communications. <coughs> uh, we ask we will have five minutes first time to speak and then three minutes thereafter. Ask folks, please refrain from personalities. And again, you can speak on anything that you, you, you like, not restricted to the earlier public hearing. Would anyone like to speak for the council tonight? Jack. Welcome, sir. Oh, thank you. Jack Sheridan. Oops. Jack Sheridan, 7 Buchanan Road. <laughs> Somebody did. <laughs> okay, you got pictures of that too, right? Actually, <laughs> um, do. First, just an update on the Senior Center, just for your edification. Uh, I got a notice from United Healthcare just within the past couple of days saying they're no longer covering silver sneakers. So the sil silver sneakers thing that he was counting on for revenue, as far as United Healthcare goes, no longer. Um, the sewer use charge, I'll call it a tax because that's what it is. They raise the, the amount for service or something, $21. So that's a tax. When it was, when it was part of the uh, Ed Valerum system and we, we had it, we had, I had sewer, sewer pipe we paid for. You know, <coughs> the, the people who have lived here all, the, all these years, we paid for the pipe when they put it in the street. Then we paid to hook up to it, saying that that would be it. And I know that I'm shredding old history there, but then, then you have this company, uh, Woodward and Curran, who tells you, consultants who tell you what the cost should be, and they miss it by a mile. And then you add the $21, which is based on the size of the valve. Karen uh, talked about it a couple of weeks ago. We're already paying to the water company for the size of a water valve coming into the house. And now, on the sewer end, we're paying because of the size of the water valve, depending on you have five-eighths or one inch or whatever size you happen to have, the, the cost escalates. So that's another, what is that, quarterly? So that's like $84 for me, additional. Just it, tell us what it is, it's a tax. What I'm afraid of is all of these things that come along, just like talking about now with the uh, rubbish collection and, and yard waste and everything, and some, some of the suggestions that were in there were charge more. Well, that's a tax again. That's an additional cost 
for taxes. And again, whatever you spend, whatever you try to, you know, it doesn't matter what pocket it goes into. You can call it a sewer use tax. You can call it an extra charge for yard waste. It's still a cost. And the number I said last time was 396 houses for sale. It's over 400 now. So, you know, it's definitely having an impact on the people. Revenue goes down, as I said before, because the value goes down because the houses do sell, but they're selling at 20% lower, 22% last I checked, uh, than what the evaluations. So you really need to stop spending. Um, and that brings me to the JFK renovation. Somebody said that I said that that was directly tied to the money that we get for the for the uh, bus in kids, the the um, school choice. I never said that. What I said was that if you take the money and you have empty seats, they're going to fill them. It doesn't matter. That's what they want. They they don't want empty seats. Can't blame them for that. If they're going to give us whatever the number is, sixty six million, seventy million. They don't want empty seats. We're building that school for more seats than we need. The demographics show that it goes down. We don't need the demographics. Let's look at the history. The town population and, and kids are down. Students are down. I mean, tremendous amount. And with all of this down fewer students closing schools, the Board of Ed budget keeps going up. Think of that as a business, because that's what it is. Who, who operates like that? Who can take that much overhead out of a business and still raise costs? It, it just doesn't make sense. Okay. Sorry. I, I'm running out of money, too, so I'll leave. Thank you. Thanks, Jack. Sorry. Anyone else like to speak for the council? Anyone else like to speak for the council? Bob? You can open the envelope. <laughs> Bob T. Katz, Woodgate Circle. Uh, 19, 1990, our town manager Chris Bromson was hired as town attorney. Back in uh, 89, there was a big problem in the town attorney's office. It was uh, needed to be reorganized. And um, they interviewed Bridget Birchall was the interim uh, town manager out of many. And Roxy Burke was the uh, mayor. And uh, they looked at uh, many, many people, and they hired Chris Bromson as the town attorney to reorganize the, the town attorney's office, and I think that was a good choice, and you guys made a good choice about him today. I'm going to talk about the open choice program. So we're, we're building more, more, we're possibly going to be, be building more seats. Well, the state looks at that, students coming out of Hartford, that's where the hub is. That's where the students come from. They look at the empty seats in all these towns. There's some towns exempt like Manchester, Bloomfield, Windsor, and, is, uh, and Vernon because the diversity is what it should be. We don't have the diversity here in Enfield. And that's why the open choice program exists. So as you build more empty seats, because we're going to lose 500 students by, 20, by 2030, so that's going to be more kids bust in. There's a schedule, and I will make you a copy of the schedule. It's 85 last year. It's going to be 95 this year. By 2020, it's going to be 137. It, it's, they twist the arms of the school system to take the students, and they pay them a stipend, like $2,000. If you get 4% of the students, there's a, there's a bonus. So what we're doing is we're just advocating to get, bring more students in from Hartford, and there's more problems that we see. And just in the last month, we've had problems with children from Hartford. 
just like the casino. They, you don't want to advertise what's going on in the schools, and we should have, be more open about it. What the, how many, the number of incidents, who's involved, because there's the police are in the schools every day doing something because of an incident. But we keep it quiet, just like the casino. And I'm going to tell you what's going on in the casino. There's some good things going down very good in Springfield. The Pride Station, they increased their business five times. The Red Rose Pizza is up 30%. Milano's and Frigo, uh, two, two Italian little delis like, their business is up. I go there all the time. Well, what's happening? There was a murder right, near, right outside the casino. Normally a murder is on the front page. It's in the back page in a little article. You can hardly see it. The gangs are fighting inside the casinos. The security is taking care of it. But there's problems, all kinds of problems in a casino. We're lucky we don't have a casino. So they suppress all the news of what's going on. There's a lot of negativity going on in Springfield that's suppressed by the newspapers and the mayor and things like that. So it's even though they got $10 million the first week, there's, a, there's a big problems. I mean, everybody's talking about this opiate uh, addiction uh, thing, 77,000 uh, deaths in the year. But if you look, at, you look at the number of deaths, where that stands, it's where we, down on the list. In fact, traffic accidents exceed that. Uh, smoking, which is, which is a, really an epidemic, 410,000 people a year die. The vaping, some of the articles talk about the deaths are going to double because of the vaping. They got middle school students, some, some elementary students, fourth and fifth graders vaping already, and we do nothing to enforce it. Massachusetts changed it to 21 to buy cigarettes. We, and here we are, sit here, we're still 18. So everybody's coming down from Massachusetts buying uh, tobacco products. The stores are, are doing bonus business. It, we, we don't control it. But anyways, congratulations, Chris. You've been here a long time. You, you know where all, all the uh, cubby holes are. And I'm sure you'll, you'll do a good job in, as a town manager. And uh, you broke the curse of uh, the town managers by some, some of the things that you're doing. Uh, a lot of towns have the same curse. Thank you. Thanks, Bob. Appreciate it. Anyone else like to speak for the council? Anyone else like to speak for the council? For the second time? Oh, sorry. Jack, no? <laughs> I was making sure, Jack. Declare public communications closed. Move on to item eight, council communications. Does any council have a communication? Councilor Arnone? Yeah, I'd like to uh, publicly thank, through Chris too, our first responders. Um, our police, our fire, especially North Thompsonville Fire Department and the uh, EMS. Um, I, we had a personal tragedy over the last uh, three weeks ago uh, today, and uh, they all responded with the utmost uh, speed and accuracy and tried everything they could uh, for my son, um, and I want to thank them. And to have uh, your first responders as your neighbors, and your friends, and uh, they were very personal. Um, I still today see their faces um, and their response and their their anguish and their their sadness. And and that's why I think having our own public employees that we know as our uh, in our service are, is tremendous and it's fantastic. And um, like Don and what you said today, to think of the good and, and the good is our first responders and our community. Our community is tremendous. We've sat here over the years and, and said, when a tragedy happens in this town, Enfield's always there. People come out and they help, and it's amazing. So I can personally attest to what a tremendous community we have. The letters, the emails, the ringing of the door. You, you lose faith at, at a point. But, you know, at the end of it all, when hundreds and hundreds of people are coming up to you and 
wanting you to help people I don't even know in some cases. You really truly know the community of Enfield is it like a small town. It's a, it's a little Mayberry in a huge, huge area. And I want to thank personally everyone um, for what they've done for us and our family. Um, it, it's been tremendous and, and just overwhelming to us. And, uh, and, and, and thank you. And, and slowly your faith gets built back up again and enough to be here tonight and say, you know, this is what I want to do and, and everyone here. And the thing I heard the most, and I'm going to end it at this, from people is, I, what can I do for you? I will do it. Just give me a call. And if there's anything you can do for me right now, your sons, your daughters, give them a hug. Give up your aunts and uncles. Give your nieces and nephews a hug. Always say I love you. Thanks. Thank you. Anyone else have any council communications? Council Crisati. This, <clears throat> this past Saturday, um, I attended the Enfield Athletic Hall of Fame uh, dinner. There are six new inductees. They, they also honored the Class L 1987 state championship runner-up and the 70s women's ice hockey program, which was the first female ice hockey program in Connecticut, I believe. And they didn't have any teams in Connecticut to play, so they played out in Western Mass, and they won five Western Mass championships, and that was uh, quite an accomplishment. The committee uh, wants to extend its gratitude to the town council for the support that's given to the, to the event, and they say thank you to all of you for your support. Going along about you know, good things in our community, I was conversing with an out-of-town resident at the dinner, and they thought that this was such a great event that it brought people together brought this community together to honor the past and the present of accomplishments that were done by uh, these athletes in Enfield. Uh, it was just a, a nice conversation that, that I had. And, uh, you know, this program set the standard for other, uh, and Mary can attest to this, set the standard for other towns, that other towns followed the Enfield Athletic Hall of Fame and set up theirs based on Enfield. So, Mary, you have a lot to do with this. Um, it's a great committee, uh, and, and keep it up, okay? Um, there's one other thing that I uh, have to mention, uh, that Mike Kotner, along with myself and committee members uh, with Mary, would like to meet with you, Chris, and with uh, the superintendent to be able to move this Athletic Hall of Fame into the Enfield High School. Uh, I think, you know, we want to talk about uh, collaborative efforts between the town, the school, and the community. Well, I think the time is now. We've had conversations about this before, but I think now, now is the time to get this done. We need a conversation, and I'd like to get it done, and get it done quick. There's, there's area for it to be done. They have the Hall of Champions. Uh, one other comment that I am going to make <clears throat> is that uh, certain committee members were not happy that they were included um, on the Hall of, Fam Hall of Champions guest list. And, um, and I kind of agree with them that they should have been uh, included with this because this is all these banners. They're all part of the, the Hall of Fame committee, but I just wanted to come out and, and state that. All right. But I still think that we need to come together and say, okay, let's, let's get this done, all right? And uh, so I just wanted to put that out there. Another thing that I, uh, another event that I went to was the, uh, the program at Enfield High School after the death of Justin Brady, which was put on by the Riverside Trauma Center, which was a, a, an open forum for parents to attend. Well, <clears throat> I was kind of a little disappointed that we didn't have more of an attendance out there by parents. And I don't know if they were kind of, uh, you know, afraid to attend or not. But this was a, a great program which offers, you know, and it showed many people, uh, you know, parents and care caregivers and the type of support 
that they can give to children impacted by trauma. And I got a lot out of it. The people that were there got a lot out of it. And, uh, you know, but it was a program that I thought was going to be, you know, heavily attended. Um, and that auditorium was pretty sparse. But, um, but once again, there, there's help that's offered out there. And people should be utilizing this. Uh, there's a lot of community support, uh, programs that are off, out there. If you have any issues, there is help that is out there. So, but those were two pretty nice community events uh, that I attended uh, over the last couple of weeks, and uh, that's all I have to say. Okay? Council Sakala. Um, just briefly a reminder to everybody that the Jack-O-Lantern Festival, the 18th annual Jack-O-Lantern Festival, I believe, is uh, Saturday the 13th. It's one of my favorite, um, right here on the green from 4 to 8. So kids can bring um, five, they can bring a carved Jack-O-Lantern and it's $5. If they bring no Jack-O-Lantern, it's $10. Lots of fun activities, trick-or-treats, um, street DJ, there'll be games, there's a hayride. Great family event, um, and it's really cool to see all of the jack-o'-lanterns, how cool they're carved and when they're all lit up. So that is um, the 13th Saturday right here on the town green. Thank you, ma'am. Councilor Bosco. Okay, as promised, um, just to let everyone know about referendums and building repairs and for the naysayers that said we didn't try to do anything and how important a referendum really is. Question three, shall the town of Enfield appropriate $44 million for reconstruction, repair, improvements to various town-owned facilities, including security enhancements to the school buildings, and authorize the issue of bond notes, temporary notes, and other obligations in the amount not to exceed $44 million to finance said appropriations? A resolution adopted by the town of Enfield, town, town, uh, the Enfield Town Council at a meeting on August 24, 2015, shall be submitted to referendum vote on voting machines or paper ballots by the town electors and qualified voters for the approval or disapproval in conjunction with the election held Tuesday, November 3rd, 2015, between the hours of 6 a.m. and 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. If approved, the resolution presented under the ballot heading uh, above will appropriate $44 million for the costs related to the construction, reconstruction, repair, improvements to various town-owned facilities, including security enhancements to school buildings, the projects. Improvements to various um, Town-owned facilities, including security enhancements, building referendum dated July 1st, 2015, the plan. The appropriation may be expanded to site improvements, design, construction costs, plumbing, electrical costs, installation costs, equipment fixtures, materials, professional fees, and administrative printing and legal and financial costs and other costs related to the projects. The appropriation shall include uh, any federal or state grants received for the project. The appropriation may be expanded to all or any portion of the individual projects listed in the plan. The town will finance the appropriations, issuing bonds, notes, and other obligations not to exceed $44 million using any, any federal, state, or other grants in aid or funds received for the project. Using monies available from the unappropriated, unencumbered general fund cash balance <laughs> in accordance with procedures, <clears throat> Chapter 4, Section 8G of the Town Charter, using the monies available from other sources determined by resolution at Town Council. The full text of the Town Council resolution is on file and available for public inspection at the Town Clerk's Office. Polling places used by the Town of Enfield for elections shall be utilized by town electors for purpose of the referendum vote. Voters qualify to vote who are not electors shall vote at Enfield Town Hall. Absentee ballots will be available from the town clerk. And question uh, three failed. I had the, okay, here it is. Question three failed on a referendum. There was 2,566 2, yes votes and 3,651 no votes. 
So for all the naysayers that said we haven't repaired any buildings and we haven't done what we should have and we let the buildings fall in disrepair, it wasn't the town council, it was the voters. I'm just going to be clarifying that till the next uh, referendum, but it's very important. You know, the people didn't want it, and they voted, and they showed their disapproval to it. And you have that same opportunity to be either for or against the next referendum, but it's very important to vote on it because the future of the town relies on that. Thank you. Thank you. Deputy Mayor Suzak. I'd like to make a motion to suspend the rules and move items E, F, G, and H to miscellaneous and proceed to vote. Motion to suspend the rules. Move, moved by uh, Deputy Mayor Suzak, second by Councilor Angar. Any discussion on the motion? Hearing none by show of hands, all those in favor? Those opposed, we have 10 in favor and zero against. Anything else? Anyone else have any comments? I could say something. Go, go right ahead. I am anticipating that the roof will be started over this long weekend at the Henry Barnard School, so those two sections will hopefully be done by the end of October, given the good weather. And I'm going to be out of town for a little while, and I'm going to take all the rain with me. All right. <laughs> and and uh, real, I'll be real quick. Um, again, I just want to thank Maya and Deb, our two uh, administrative assistants, for a fantastic uh, proclamation for honoring Corona's market. Well done. I mean, very well done. I, I just, I know my pronunciation isn't the best, so I hope I did it justice because, again, it was a well done proclamation honoring, obviously, a hundred year uh, business in town, which is great. I want to thank them. Um, I also remind folks, again, I think you've heard some comments from counselors. Again, there's the mayor's spotlight, nominate a neighbor or business out there who's done a good deed. We want to honor those folks. But be a bit, I know a lot of businesses, we have very good corporate partners in this town who donate a lot of money, a lot of their time, a lot of, a lot of their own supplies to the, all the events that go on in town. It takes two minutes to go onto the website and, and nominate. Just reminding folks. Um, I want to thank St. Martha's Church for inviting me to their carnival slash car show. I am not an expert at cars, but uh, man, there were a lot of nice cars at that car show, and it was a really great event. I give the church credit. You know, they're out there trying to save, save themselves. They do it the old-fashioned way. They're pounding the pavement and working hard. And it was great to be a part of it. And again, in, in closing, I think this is something you know, I, I, we touched on a little bit, and I don't want to steal Councilor Denny's thunder, but I think we do need a joint, and maybe if, if, if the council's willing at some point, a letter to the Board of Education, a joint workshop to deal with security. And also, uh, for me, I think it's a little above that with some of the things that have happened on social media that have effect, affected our police showing up to events with kids which I think needs to start being addressed, where folks are basically saying fire in a movie theater. I'm talking about adults. I think it's sort of, I don't know what you want to call it, a, we can call it whatever we want, but I think Councillor Denny is 100% right. I think it's time that we start addressing some of these issues, you know, as a joint committee. And, uh, you know, I think it's, I think it's something that we need to do. And again, I'm just throwing out general ideas. I know I've gotten some emails on specifics, and, um, but I think it would be a good idea to start getting that back and then building on it to where we start having you know good adult conversations on some of the things that are affecting our kids so i think uh if, i don't know well, we can talk about specifics but i'd like to do that and um you know counselor dan i don't want to steal your thunder because i know it's your idea you know and um i think that's it i think that's it yep. moving on to uh town manager report item nine Good evening. Um, you have the updated uh, project and activities report, and if there are any questions on that. Any questions on the PAR from anyone? Councilor Arnone. Just a comment on Magic Bus going live on, um, they actually can follow the bus now on, the, on your phone, on your mobile phone, which is a, a very awesome thing. I know the bus, the state's buses, you can do that. So you can literally see them coming down the street so you know when the bus is actually going to be there. Um, and what routes they're taking and which way they're going. So you can anticipate uh, much better um, when a, a bus will arrive on time. And, and uh, so it's a good, good part of the, uh, you go on Google's map. So Google map, you'd put in buses and it shows the entire bus route and it actually shows the bus in real time moving to each bus stop. So you can tell uh, when they get there. So it's a, a good uh, upgrade and um, it's a way to keep it uh, modern. Thanks. You're welcome. Councilor Denny. Yes. Um, 
from the mayor to the town manager. I, I have a question about Tanglewood and the gas with Eversource. Uh, are we going to plan on, I know it's October 1st now, uh, I know Eversource is tied up in the Boston area, <clears throat> and the gas lines in about six or seven, six of those houses that are on Tanglewood, we might not be able to complete that project before the winter. Uh, is there any kind of a contingency plan? And I would like to think about if there is one, you know, what are we going to do, how to plow that, that street and do what we have to do? Because <coughs> I don't think they're going to get to those gas lines before it's paving time. That's all. Thank you. Welcome. I'll inquire. Councilor Casati. Yep, through the mayor to the town manager. Chris, could you just give us a, an update? Um, a little confused about the leases here for the playscape at Hazardville and pool equipment at the annex. I, I, I am familiar with the, uh, the ambulance refurbishment and the chassis replacement, but could you give a, an update on that? Uh, I can ask John Wilcox. He had made uh, real efforts <coughs> to make sure that those leases were done, and I know I had signed them over the last week or so. The ambulance chassis, we were in uh, danger of losing it, so he really had to expedite that financing, likewise with the Playscape. So those are in place. Bond Council expedited them so they could be signed and get those um, all three of the things you mentioned in the works. For any other specifics, um, I can have John follow up with you tomorrow, but that was the reason for those leases being done um, so that those projects could be accomplished on time as they were promised. You. You're welcome. Thanks. Any other questions for the town manager? Chris, I just had two quick points on the par. So Prospect Street, um, where Kelly Fredette, where we've you know basically brown, we've gotten a brownfield grant, we've cleaned that property, we're gonna give it to Kelly Fredette. Can we make sure that we have just a comment to the planning and zoning that if they pass the gateway, which I'm fine with, that that new property wouldn't be grandfathered in because they haven't built on it yet? And we've spent a ton of money cleaning that up, and that's got to be that's got to be an exception. And I want to publicly state it because, again, the prior councils, not just this council, but prior councils have been working on this for a number of years, and I know Kelly Fredette is going to – we're going to eventually give them that property, or if we've already done it, we may have already done it. I don't know, but I just want to make sure that, you know, again, we can't. Yeah, you know, it has to be clean. But that's part of whatever grandfathering goes in, even though they haven't built in that property, that should be included. Because I mean, because again, we spent. I know this council and prior councils have spent money on this. Uh, and along the same line, South River Street. Again, I just want to publicly thank Director Noons and his staff. Again, that that table of contents or that timeline of all the work that they did is exactly how we should be documenting this stuff. So if folks want to claim that we're not doing our job, I mean, it's pretty clear that those folks did their job. So I mean, again, well done for them, for those folks. That's all I have. Um, elderly tax credit. Yes, uh, this is a, a subject that had come up last year in the budget, late in the, in the discussions, so that the council basically was in a position to extend it. I'm not going to get into all the details, but we had recommended uh, for the second year in, in a row that the council match the state's grant. Basically, it's up to $350,000 by the state. The town can then match it. It's an unfunded mandate now. The state has, re have, has re removed their um, backing of it. So last year, because people had already put in for it, the town felt compelled, even in the tough budget year afterwards, to, to fund the additional $350,000 to match the state. This year, um, we had talked to the subcommittee and to leadership, and John Wilcox has sent out a letter to the recipients of the elderly tax credit and those disabled households who received it last year that it will be a subject for discussion this year in the budget starting in the spring, and that it is not guaranteed that the council will again um, match the unfunded mandate. So we thought it appropriate to give notice early on in the process so they didn't rely on it in their budgeting so that they understand. We left the number for them to call for further information, but it will be taken up by the council to see if there's sufficient funds this year to do it. You did it the last two years, even though the state pulled the funds and it's an unfunded mandate, but we felt it appropriate to do it early enough this year so that you can discuss in the upcoming budget. Um, that will be sent out to everybody who received it, over 600 families, and also we're going to put it on our web site as well for the general uh, population to be aware in case anybody was considering filing for it. Um, and if there's no other questions on that, 
uh, I will ask Lori Whitney to come up. There's been a lot of talk on the TIF, um, the tax incremental uh, financing, which is something that we started to work on. We had a change of staff. Um, Lori's picked up the baton. Uh, I wish Peter were here. Um, to hear it. She's going to give a brief overview because it's not as simple. It, it, we're going to tomorrow. Didn't want to burden you tonight. She has an entire packet um, with what ha has happened in the past, the background, the statutes, and all of the things that have to be done. But she's going to give you a thumbnail today of what needs to be done going forward, which she has commenced working on. Uh, but we'll send that to you tomorrow so you have all of the information available. Yeah. Welcome, Lori. Oh, thank you very much. Um, so basically, I tried to um, interpret what has happened thus far based on the files that were left behind. So um, at this point, what has been accomplished is that there has been, I did find two different presentations, that fr one from, I believe, Mike Seriello, and one from uh, Attorney Michael Andriana. I'm not sure if they were actually presented to the council, but I believe at least Michael's was. I Mike's think. was, yeah. Yeah, so those were very comprehensive presentations, and I thought they were, they were very good. So if we need to have them redone, we could do that. Um, the one thing that has been accomplished is the TIF policy has been developed. So, and that is basically um, the application to apply for a TIF once we get the district in place. So that is uh, explaining the t details, terms, eligibility, and, and the uh, process for the application. So, and you, I have, I'm hoping you recognize this. <laughs> Maybe, I don't know. So I will send this out with the packet. Um, I don't know whether this was ever adopted. There's no date on this. There's no, you know, it doesn't say who it was from or anything. So, but it does say town of Enfield on it. So, <laughs> that's that's a that's a good start. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I you think, think it was a workshop. I think that was presented to us at Lori at our. Uh, yeah. I'll, I'll include this committee. with the information. So what what I did is I met with Mark Serrato this morning and and he. Um, gave me all of the different uh, uh, statutes that are required to, that, that we are required to adhere to, and it's the enabling statutes. Um, there was a tentative timeline that was presented, and unfortunately that said that it, uh, we were going to be on par with, uh, on, on time with everything starting in June of this year. Unfortunately, with the staffing levels the way they were, I think that kind of got dropped. So we need to kind of go backwards a little bit. Um, the big thing that we still need to do is the master plan itself, and that has numerous elements included. Um, we have to do the boundary, tax ID numbers for all included parcels, public facilities improvement programs, which is a process in itself, time frame for the districts, a financial plan, again, with its own elements that are going to be required. Um, at minimum, we're going, to need, we're going to need input from the departments of finance, assessors, public works, planning, WPCA, building, and health in order to get that plan in, um, up to the point where we can implement it and adopt it. Um, I did call uh, Jen Rodrigue, who's the town planner in Winterlocks, and asked how long it took them to do their master plan. And with two very knowledgeable professionals leading the way, um, it took them six months, but that was a very aggressive six months. So um, that kind of as a timeline, just to do the master plan, I'm figuring six to eight months at minimum. Now, th a lot of it may have been accomplished already, and perhaps I haven't found it yet, because I'm still going through a lot of files. <laughs> so hopefully some of it has been accomplished. <laughs> um, so, and in addition to that, once that is actually developed, then um, the town council has, uh, is going to take about three to four months. You have to actually... Um, consider how the TIF will contribute to the economic growth of the community, and then you, the town council forwards the master plan to the planning commission, and the planning commission then has 90 days to review and comment back to the town council, and then you must hold one public hearing at least. So, it's about another year. So, uh, plus or minus. So, um, just as a quick next steps, um, I have a, a call in to attorney Andriana, um, so hopefully I'll be speaking with him in short time. 
Um, and I plan on working towards uh, restarting the meetings with the TIF committee because I guess they kind of fell apart a little bit. Uh, not fell apart, but um, through the summer months, it, they just didn't meet very often. And also at the EDC. Um, I think our big next thing is to define the TIF district boundaries because I have a very rough map from the, my predecessor. And then what we could do is establish a new timeline and report back to the town council with that. So, thank you. There's Any a questions? lot of details in the Council statutes. Unknown? Thank you, Lori. <laughs> yeah. So unfortunately, it was probably a year ago we started talking about this, and um, and and not to anyone's uh, fault in this uh, in this room uh, right now, because I know we've all discussed it at length, and have been following you know Windsor Locks very closely. You know, you can the Montgomery Building. Uh, that was a building everybody had got, uh, given up on a, a generation ago. And this TIF uh, district uh, was the spark that the contractor needed to come in and invest in this building. And now with a sports arena too, which is off of uh, 91 Route 20, they have a proposal for a sports arena. That's another TIF that they have um, put out there. Now, the, the, again, the developers are, are seeking these. So the, the tax that is increased from the development on that property is then reused back into that district. So this is very, this is huge draw for developers because that um, you know that also just helps their business to have the surrounding businesses uh, prosper from the TIF. And um, I just w wish we were there at this year right now um, because there everyone else is uh, already using this and a few other uh, towns and I think New Britain also uses this uh, uh, quite a bit and we're losing the developers to them and uh, uh, for properties maybe uh, a a as local as the mall and I'm not talking about new properties I'm talking about you know properties downtown uh, uh, that we could use to you know refurbish and get better housing um, so yeah we need to I think we need to really uh, concentrate on this and maybe help some consultant work because I know that's what Windsor Locks also used were, were some, they got some help um, from consultants that really helped the process along and help staff with it. So I'm all in favor if we need to, you know, uh, while we're down a few people there, we could spend that money and in, in some consultants to, to actually uh, get some uh, wheels rolling. But thank you for digging in the files. I, I know it's, it's, it's got to be difficult. Thank you. Anyone else? Any questions? Deputy Mayor Suzak? You know, we actually had a presentation where someone came in and we had a TIF workshop. And I think that was like two years ago, because I'm sitting here thinking I thought we were way further along yeah. <laughs> in the process than we are now. Because, you know, the ones Tom's talking about is the, the TIFs that are project specific. And it goes right back into that project, into something that that project needed. The one in New Britain is. Um, probably more regional because it's their whole main street in New Britain is a TIF. So, you know, we, they, they talked about the percentages and how much you can, you know, use. And I had thought we were like way further along. And I don't know if that was recorded or not. I don't think so. You know, I, you know we go to these things and, you know, it, it gets picked up by somebody else. And we kind of, we participate and move along and participate and move along. And we get really frustrated. But um, keep working at it because I think it's it's really important because you know you get involved in these things and you start seeing <clears throat> as much as I hate to disagree with people, but I look at you know the the um, real estate exchanges and I do see the the values of the property going up in Enfield. I often think that you know maybe our our properties on our tax bases are undervalued a little bit and I know we'll be going for another assessment pretty soon but keep it up Lori we're, we're gonna get this we'll button it down yeah I agree with Councilor Arnone I mean is there a way we can use consultants if if yeah. to move this I mean I'm sorry a year from now seems to me a little too that's why be, uh, slow for lack of a better word in her reporting this to me I wanted to come before the council to let you know where we really were and what it would take so that's why she's going to send all of this information to you she's going to make the contacts with the consultants that the other town used and then we'll get back to as to if we use them what would it be and how much right. sooner could we do it right I, I, and I'm I agree I'm looking for a recommendation and we don't need workshops we just want you folks right. to get to start moving along yeah. I mean I think we do a ton of workshops but we don't actually let the folks who are doing their job help them do their job. I mean, I'm, I'm, I love being informed, but at some point we got to let you folks do your job. So 
let's hire a consultant, let help them to do their job, and then fill us in when it's ready to go. So I think uh, I think that's the key, you know. And I'm going to do a report as well, um, and it's similar news on the Gateway Project. I'm not going to bring it up this evening. She's digging into that because we had a time frame to report back to the state with the plan by October 14th. She had a public hearing. We've had meetings. And in her dealing with the uh, official from the state, who she knows well, the town has asked for numerous extensions over the, since they applied for the grant in 2015 and has really not done anything. There will be no more extensions. And that deadline will come. It will pass. We will be getting no more money. We will be getting no more reimbursements. We've dedicated and spent over $100,000, which we will, if we were to abandon it, we would owe the state back. So there's a project. You're going back three years. I think on some of these things, there was a lot of talk and there right. was a lot of music but uh there really wasn't much you know dancing going on and so we're trying to get a hold of it and i'll just tell you again we're going to have a report on the novak we had that that issued we're going to be prepared to go to the subcommittee i've been meeting with the director of um public works he has a plan for reorganization like we did with um planning we have a plan we've got the recommendations that we're going to come to you to say these are the top recommendations Perfect. how do you want to impl implement them over this many years these are the costs we want to get things done um not lip service but just real timelines and boots on the ground and we're going to get things accomplished but these these last couple of projects for whatever reason um the attention wasn't given to them. So we're trying to remedy that, uh, but it's going to cost a little bit and it's going to take us a little longer. But I assure you, with Lori in place, we're getting a new a director and her staff, we're going to get the job done. Councilor Cassati. I just want to thank Lori for her hard work uh, and that she's, what she's been doing with, with the TIF update and with the, the reorganizing, with the, the zoning on that Rivergate uh, I was at the last meeting on Thursday, and uh, you know you did a great job of listening to the residents. And you're going to go back to the drawing board. You're going to, you know, you're going to redo it. I know you. There's a uh, that guideline, October 13th or 14th, and all that information has to be done. You've been working awfully hard. We really appreciate all the work that you've been doing and digging through all these files. So um, we do a a appreciate that, and it's a very difficult task. And you know, once again, if consultants need to be called in to, to help with this, you know, I'm all for it. You know, but I just <coughs> want to commend you for your, your hard work, and you were given all this to say, here you go, and uh, and you're and you're really working working hard, you and your staff at doing this, and I have to say that you get back to people, and you're honest with people. And that's what people appreciate. So thank you. Thank you. Any other questions for Lori? Thank you very much. Appreciate okay. it. Thank you very thank much. Thank you, Lori. Bye. Chris, anything else from the town manager? What I'd like to do, only because he thought he was going to be coming up, if we could take out a turn, uh, Sergeant Meyer, just uh, to answer some of the uh, questions from the public hearing because he has another commitment, if that would be okay. Sure. And I will just caution you, I don't know that if, if any substantive changes are going to be made beyond what they've done, I'll defer to the town attorney, you'd have to start the process over. So I think he can respond, but you know what you have for this evening, I think, is pretty much cast in stone. If you're going to do something more, um, I would recommend that we listen to him first. If there's other things we can do, then maybe you have to do amendments later, or we've got to start the whole process over. Susan, Sergeant? do we need a motion to take, it, take out order? Or? Can we just do we have a motion to add them or it's under my reports so yeah, i think yeah. we can just have them come up welcome sorry just want to make sure welcome thank you thank you so i don't know uh, if you want to just give <coughs> oh, we have do you want to give a general over like maybe the main difference between the two ordinances and then if folks have questions does that work sure yeah i, I mean because i know some folks are high, asking about the highlighted language that's the change so maybe if you just sure. give that for feel it'd be great so I've been in my position a couple of years now and the traffic division, we kind of administer this ordinance as far as the enforcement aspect of things. Um, and the longer I've been in there, the more I've referenced the ordinance when we run into difficulties and the more that I've seen that we're having hurdles and challenges um, where we question whether we can do some things that the ordinance technically allows us to do. Um, and so that's kind of where we started. Um, so we referenced with the town attorney's office and uh, we came up with what you guys have here, um, I know I heard people bring up some concerns. Some people do have some valid concerns. Um, 
the question was, or, or the problem that we had was, even though they're valid concerns, we may not have a way that we can address them um, in all cases. And I know like the towing, for example. Um, I don't know how deep you want me to go into it. Um, Just but maybe the major change between the two, or I mean, what's what's the major change between the two ordinances? Really, um, the concerns that came up were um, people wanted to know what the building line was. It was defined in one of the zoning ordinances. It wasn't defined in here, so they added the definition. They copied it out from the zoning ordinance. Um, unregistered motor vehicles, the definition was changed um, to make it enforceable by the PD. Um, the old definition, um, said that the uh, an unregistered vehicle is one that was required by the Department of Motor Vehicles to be registered. No vehicles on private property are required to be registered by the Department of Motor Vehicles. Um, so we had trouble enforcing that. We actually suspended that um, until we can get this change in. Um, open area was changed, the definition of open area. I know people brought up concerns about uh, having an enclosed area making them exempt. Um, so this ordinance was amended to allow enforcement for fences anywhere that can be seen from abutting properties um, or from the roadway. Um, and that's, I believe that's most of the highlights from the ordinance here, from the changes. Were there any um, Any questions for Officer questions or? Councilor Arnon? So we had a picture tonight now, uh, of the one uh, that was next to the realty company. Now, now you have a car that's semi dismantled it has a tarp you know laying over out from the engine onto the ground really pretty blatant um abandoned vehicle so how is this new ordinance going to help a situation like that to get that vehicle out of there i don't know a lot about this specific complaint um the old ordinance did address abandoned vehicles, unsightly vehicles, the same as the new one does. Um, and it did require them to have a car fitted cover, not just a tarp um, behind the building line. Well, we interpreted the building line. Now we have the actual definition. Um, so if the if that vehicle is in violation of that wordage, we would be able to, under the current ordinance, cite the owner. The trouble with the current ordinance too is that um, it took 60 days before we saw the first action. Um, under the current one here, um, the new one here, it would be 30 days and then another 10 days and we would cite them. Um, I know somebody did bring up the fines. I mean, we're going to write them under the new ordinance, the two tickets, and unfortunately we aren't going to be able to remove it. However, under the current ordinance, even though it says we can remove it, the police department's not going to go in somebody's backyard in a fence without a search warrant to to remove a vehicle. Right. Um, so, I, I mean, if it's an issue where this is an unsightly vehicle, the cover's blown off, then absolutely we can, under the current ordinance, enforce that. But it's still going to take 60 days under the new... We right? have to warn the, the property old, owner. We have to give the, them a copy yeah. of the ordinance. So and then it starts it. the clock. Some of the other problem is that we run into challenges with warning the owner. You can't get a hold of them. Who is the owner? Is it in foreclosure? Is it... And, you know, we run into a lot of these hurdles. So the clock doesn't even start sometimes for quite a while. Um, in this particular case, as long as we can get a hold of the owner and warn them, we can start the clock, we can start remediating it. So, so one quick sideline over to Chris. Now, where's the line drawn with blight? Because we can chalk up some blight violations real quick. It sounds like some of these things should be dealt with on blight and not through our, our police department, again, overtaxing them with these, these small things that should probably be on our blight officers. Well. You know, I defer to the town attorney. I mean, like, as I said, we're, we're with the blight ordinance it's specific. There is a little overlap that somebody had mentioned that we don't want to tax the police officers with. But there's certain things with blight that are covered. Um, we'll be coming before the subcommittee. We, the town attorney's office actually has drafted amendments to the blight ordinance to, to appoint the committee, to be looking at things about fines, going to court, being able to let people appeal to you. So that'll be part of it. We're actually meeting next week. Um, in regard to, I, I, you know, from my point of view, perhaps uh, the sergeant or Marie can opine on, I, I don't know if the blight ordinance applies to vehicles. I mean, it applies to other matters, but I don't know that it applies to unregistered or abandoned vehicles. Even if they look blighted like those pictures we just saw tonight, that, that to me is blight. If it was a, if it was a, you know, if I have a, a dismantled vehicle just spewing parts all over driveway with tarps that are flying in the wind, I don't see a right. difference. It, it, is, it is blight. 
However, this particular ordinance was passed as a blight ordinance. So this is another type of blight ordinance. It just has the extra added component of the, of police. the police because the property maintenance officers aren't able to do anything with the motor vehicles. So, so this is still considered a blight ordinance. So can people start on blight and end up with police? Or do we have some sort of... Uh, Only uh, in terms of the motor vehicle piece. The property maintenance officers, they address the blight or you know, the property maintenance only. But when it comes to the motor vehicles, that's why it gets shifted over. Go. Okay. And, you know, to that point, there was a comment about unsightly materials. Right. That, this ordinance is, is one of those things that has morphed many times over the years. And it may just be that it needs to continue to be refined so that it is completely compatible with the property maintenance. Right. But there isn't the overlap where people are saying, this is, you know, you do it, you do it. So, right. so initially it was clear that this was intended for the police because the police have powers that obviously the property maintenance officers don't have. Okay, great. So if we can get some time to get uh, two departments to help each other work out a little bit without um, ignoring each other and some of the blight things, I think it would be uh, useful for, for you. So thank you. Councilor Bosco, then Deputy Mayor Susan. <laughs> okay, I see um, an issue on Section 38-144, uh, <coughs> Section C. Um, it says it's not applied to record service until 60 days from required filing data. Well, the problem is I've had cars there that we towed for the police department, um, especially if it's a state police car, sometimes they're there for six months trying to get paperwork from the state. So that does not work. Uh, you know, we, we have our, our uh, 30 to 45 days that we have to hold the car depending on the value of the car. And then we can start filing. We have to notify lien holders first. Then when we get the lien holder paperwork out, then we can file to the state. It usually takes anywhere between a month to two months. I, I have some stuff that's there six months, seven months, because I can't get paperwork. So um, that needs to be looked at. And also it's incorrect here where it says uh, statutory mandate notification procedures sent copies there for, to the chief of police. We don't send paperwork to the chief of police. We send them to the commissioner of motor vehicles because that's, that's where they go. We don't, we don't notify the chief of police. Matter of fact, the police department is supposed to give us the 114 before we can do any paperwork. And that's one of the problems we have with the state police because they won't give you a 114 until they're done with their reports and sometimes they're a month. I mean, I have a couple serious motor vehicle accidents that are sitting in our pen now. They've been there for three months. I can't do paperwork. I can't do anything because there's a hold on them. Um, so that section even though you know it may be overlooked or whatever but if you're going to make something that's going to be more uh legal we, you really need to get the the wording right and again you know I, I got what the the two possible fatalities down there they've been there actually i think one of them's probably been there for for four months and i can't do anything with that and now if the people once you release them the people uh, don't pick them up, they could sit there another six months. And all these cars that we are, we are talking in this subsection C are all done per order of the police department. You know, we, we, we probably do 30%, if not more, of cars we don't get paid for. So um, I, we, we sort of need to look at that one section right there. Yeah, that's, that's old language, but we can certainly look at it. I didn't realize it was as problematic as... Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, we asked Michael. Luckily, you guys do 109, so, you know, we're only down to a month or two. Yeah, we can certainly look at that. Deputy Mayor Suzak, I'll set you up. So, I guess I, a, a further clarification is, you know, the house that we're looking at, that abandoned, dismantled vehicle is actually within the setback area. That thing sits right on the property line. Mm -hmm. And... So does um, Mr. Slade in my favorite car on South Road. I'm sure you're familiar with it. It's been there forever. Mm -hmm. It is really 
in the town, almost it butts the town right away. It can't possibly be, even though it's behind their house, it's sitting there in the right of way on our side of the fence. And we have a, I have another property that has a car that sits on the property line with a rotten boat in a trailer next to it. This is a huge problem for property owners. I mean, we all bring up our property and if you're gonna go sell it, you're gonna go rent it, you're gonna do whatever you're gonna do or even live in it, you don't wanna look at this. And we really have to put some teeth into this thing that I, I see that we need something and we need something a little bit more, a little bit clearer that we can do something. But I think we also have to look at these, these cars and piles of trash that are right against the property line. The other one is the one on South George Washington, Middle Road on the Triangle. Mm -hmm. He's probably so in the I'm setback. He's in the setback. So if he's in the setback, let's get him <laughs> out of there. I mean, it's just, it doesn't do any good for the town and it doesn't do any good for our citizens. And, you know, I, I sent Chris something and I looked at other states because my kids went to live in other states and there's no such thing in some other states as an unregistered vehicle. You know, we play the, you know, if I don't register my vehicle, I don't have to pay insurance, I don't have to pay property tax. We, we, we do this like do -si do around to do things. And, you know, maybe, you know, we ought to look at California. When you go, they say, what kind of car is it? Is it street worthy or is it sitting there? And they have two different kinds of registration and they don't pay a small amount. They also don't pay property tax. The state gets it up front and it gets it for every vehicle because every vehicle, irregardless of the value of the vehicle, they have the same kind of um, impact on the society. So, you know, we've, we've listened and it's actually one of the most complaint things we get, <laughs> believe it or not, sure. that it's like, you know, and we want, to, we want to work with everybody and do everything. And I really wish our blight people could take care of this rather than have the police have to take care of this. That would be a huge improvement. So thank you. Maria. If I could, yeah. just to Councillor Suzak's point. In Connecticut, real pro or personal property it still has to be taxed. Those cars, just because they're unregistered, doesn't mean they don't get taxed. So people still have to pay personal property on those. We, we go by the, the statute that's here. And just to give some background, because I feel like we're kind of starting in on the middle of this. When it was clear from the police that there were areas here that were difficult to enforce, so there was overlap, everyone had a say in trying to make it, make it better, respond to those issues that were specifically addressed. Now it looks as though new areas are being addressed, and that's totally appropriate for you to consider. But just so you know, in terms of the public hearing, the ordinance that was set out for everyone, if there were going to be major changes, that's something that would either have to be amended later or you would not vote in favor of it tonight. There is still an ordinance on the books. There, there are still parts of it that are enforceable, but I'm going to defer to Sergeant Meyer, who's done a lot of work in terms of the specifics of the enforceability of this. And the whole goal was to make sure it complied with the statutes. But some of the points that were raised this evening, those were never raised by staff or we weren't given an opportunity to look at them in terms of revising them. And it's certainly within your purview to have us do that if you're not happy with sections that are there. From what I'm hearing, this is a good first step but we have more steps to take. Yeah, I would just say what had occurred, uh, you know, there was a referral back about this being difficult because it didn't comply with what the police needed. And then we sent it to all of the blight and all the different zoning for their input. Didn't go to council for their input because nobody's really realizing the expertise of Mr. Bosco on it, but he makes a good point. That's an important one. So what I would suggest is we'll take all of the comments made by, at the public hearing to see uh, in regard to infractions, unsightly, the uncovering, if it's partially viewable, see if we can tweak all of those, address Councilman Bosco, address uh, your concerns, and then, um, what? You know, we'll send it to council again. Why can't we just have another public hearing on it? 650, if we make this Excuse me? If we make any changes tonight, why can't we just have another public hearing? Tonight? You can. Why don't we just do that? Well, I, you, you, you're not, we're, they're not going to be able to make all the changes you want this evening right. and, and, you know, no, make know. sure That's that they pass muster. I, I think really, if it's this, you know, big an issue, I think really we should have another meeting. We can address these issues and we should put it out there again for one of our six to seven o'clock meetings. Right. Let the public know, let everybody come in again and 
let's have at the whole thing because that wasn't why it was being amended. And if there are other things, removing unsightly, looking if blight can do more, let's do it all at once. Right. Um, we already have this ordinance on the books that you know is still enforceable, although flawed. It, it, it's enforceable. And then if there are other purposes that we want to accomplish, let's do it once. Uh, I'm sorry, Councilor Known. I'm going to pass. So then it's Councilor Bosco, Councilor Ungar, then Councilor Denny. Well, what I'll be honest with you. What I'd like to see, uh, one thing is, is if you have a corner well, lot, you're, you really have an issue, uh, you know, because you can't. All I'll say is, that, remember, this this is an item on the agenda. Correct. So I, I don't know if we want to hold our comments till we get to the item on the agenda. Just from saying, I know unless you have a specific well, question. Well, I would say we should be done with it. I'm just saying, it, was that a specific question? You want to go back at it then? Well, we're going to have it's on the agenda, we, right? I know, but well, we moved Meyer it. Won't be here. Right. right. That's what I'm saying. So your questions should be specific for Officer Meyer, right? That's all I'm saying. As long as we're going back yeah. at it, oh, yeah, I'll, that's I'll all I'm saying. Sorry, I, I don't want to cut anyone off, but yeah, go ahead. I just wanted to make one point. I think there's a huge difference in the cars that we're talking about tonight versus hobbyists, because there's plenty of people that work on their cars, antique Mopars. There's a whole different category that I haven't even really seen addressed yet. So I think we really need to tweak it more. Yeah, that's where Councilor Denny. Continue. Your only con <clears throat> your only concern here is with more vehicles, totally? Is is basically what this is all about? More than that, but yeah, primarily we deal with the motor vehicles. Because I think and maybe it's for the agenda when we're talking about it, but I, I think trailers and boats and all of that needs to be incorporated in some of this. No, there, yeah. some of it is incorporated in um, the old ordinance. It, some of it was, um, but the definition, you know, just needed some updating, and, and we've updated the definition to really broaden it a little bit more. Um, but you know, certainly worth looking to make sure we have everything that people okay. are concerned so, over. No, I think we'll just bring it up and yeah, uh, Gina, Councilor Scala, sorry. No, that's all right. Um, I, I guess just one comment is I believe somebody did mention if somebody was deployed and there was military, maybe we need a provision in there. And also perhaps looking into when people are going through probate of an estate, yep. you can't get rid of property until there's a final um, accounting done and you can close the estate. So that's also something that maybe needs to be addressed or thought about at that point. Okay. Okay. Any other questions specifically for Officer Meyer? Because this is, again, is item G. We'll have this again to discuss. I just didn't want to get into a full discussion when we're, we actually have it in the agenda. No, I just wanted to be able to yeah. have him available for your yeah. questions at this point, and then we can bring it back up. All right, great. Thank you, Thank you Sergeant. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, item 10, Town Attorney Report. <coughs> Good evening, everyone. I have no formal report. Any questions for the Town Attorney? Hearing none, item 11, report of any special committees of the council. Does anyone have a... Uh, report on their committee. Councilor Ungar. Um, I just want to say that uh, last week's public safety meeting was canceled and we're going to have it scheduled for this Thursday at 3 30. And go ahead, Councilor. And the discussion will be on cart. Golf, golf carts. Go carts? Go carts. No, <laughs> golf carts. <laughs> and I, I, the question I have is if if the public comes, can they speak or only listen? It's only if it's on the agenda, right? Yeah. Uh, the subcommittees are yeah. not set up for public communication. Right. They have an agenda and, yeah. you know, we can look into it, but that's not yeah. how they are yeah. uh, under the rules and procedures. But they're welcome the to come and listen. Yes. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Item 12, old business. Uh, a, appointments for the town council. Item 1, we have none. Appointments from on page two from number tw two to number 15, the town council has none. On page three from items listed 16 to 19, again, the town council has none. Item B, appointments from the town manager, one through nine. Are there any appointments of the town manager? No. None from the town manager. We move on to page four. Again, town manager appointments from 10 to 14, none. none. Item C, do I have a motion to remove the resolution dissolving the infill high High School Renovation Committee. So moved. By Councilor Arnone. Second. Seconded by Councilor Ungar. All those in favor of moving from the table by a show of hands. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Ten in favor and zero against. So the on, Chris, I'll just defer to you, the sort of the discussion on dissolving the building committee for the town uh, from the infill high. Anything we want to comment other than just time 
No, there's an item on the agenda later that will address yep. how we'll proceed after this dissolution occurs. So it was good that we waited uh, and, and were able to talk to finance and have a meeting with members of that committee to address how we dissolve this but also conclude the project. Deputy Mayor Suzak. I guess, as you know, it's been one of the hardest working um, committees that we have. Um, six years, we have a wonderful high school. Um, I would like, though, to say that we will be honoring all the members of the building committee at our first November meeting, where we will formally thank them for their commitment and their service. Very good. I'm going to read the resolution if no one has any other comments at this time. Dissolving the Enfield High. Uh, yeah. So, resolution dissolving the Enfield High School Renovation Building Committee, whereas the town, Enfield Town Council established the Enfield High School Renovation Building Committee, otherwise known as the committee, to oversee the design and reconstruction of the end of Enfield High School, other than I know as the project, and whereas the committee has successfully overseen the design and reconstruction of Enfield High, and the project is substantially complete, and whereas the project will continue to generate invoices and receive reimbursements from the state of Connecticut. Therefore, be it resolved, the town council authorized the town manager, along with the director of finance, to administer the remainder of the project. Be it further resolved that the Enfield Town Council does hereby dissolve the Enfield High School Renovation Building Committee, effective the date of this resolution, with sincerest appreciation and thanks to the members of the committee for their diligent hard work, for their diligent work bringing the project to its successful completion, submitted by the town manager on 10-1-2018. So moved. By Councillor Arnone, Second. seconded by Councillor Crisati. Any discussion on the main motion? Hearing none, roll call, please. Deputy Mayor Suzak. Four. Councillor Ungeyer. Four. Councillor Arnone. Four. Councillor Bosco. Four. Councillor Sakala. Four. Councillor Crisati. Four. Councillor Davis. Four. Councillor Denny. Four. Mayor Ludwig. Four. Councillor Muller. Four. There's 10 in favor, none against, and no abstentions. Item 13 on the agenda, new business. Items A, we have no consent agenda. Item B, appointments of the town council, we have none. Item C, appointments of the town manager, we have none. And item D, appointments, P and Z commission, again, we have none. Item 14, items for discussion. No. Item A uh, has been moved to miscellaneous. Mr. Mayor? Yep. You did have one item on the consent agenda. Yes, yeah, that's under, did but it was oh. under, yeah, move it to, for some reason, there's a consent agenda, new business, and uh, items for discussion. All right. So, so I don't know if we need maybe future to get rid of it. Suzanne. Pardon? So, uh, do we need a consent agenda, new business? There's no item. I know, but I mean, like we never. Every time it comes on, it's items for discussion. Okay. Yeah, it's, it, it should be moved. Yeah, should uh, I don't know if it's just a duplication of the agenda. Yeah. Okay. Yep. So, item A, 14A. Consent agenda has been moved to miscellaneous. Item B, town council appointments. Item one and two, we have none. Item C, town manager appointed, we have none. And item D, we have uh, P and Z commission appointed, we have none. Items E through H have been moved to miscellaneous. So we move to miscellaneous item 15 for the consent agenda. <coughs> um, bum, 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 bum. It is the final closeout of the books, transfers to close out fiscal year. 2017 through Ju July 1, 2018. Again, an annual event. It's on a consent agenda. I don't know if anyone has any questions or comments. If not, by a show of hands, all those in favor of approving the consent agenda? Those opposed? Any abstentions? 10 in favor, zero against. Okay, we move to item E. On, in, on, in miscellaneous, which is resolution adopting a building permit technician assistant job description. Resolved in accordance with Chapter 7, Section 2 of the Town Charter, the Enfield Town Council does hereby adopt the job description for the position of Building Permit Technician Assistant, submitted on September 21st, 2018, by Lori Witten, Director of Development Services. So by Deputy Mayor Suzak, seconded by Councillor Muller. Any discussion? I know this is through the real... Right, it's, it's currently budgeted, but there was not a job description, so Lori, and, and for us to be able to go out um, and clarify exactly the job, we... They prepared one, and this is it. Hearing none, roll call, please. Deputy Mayor Suzak. Four. Councillor Ungeyer. Four. Councillor Arnone. Four. Councillor Bosco. Four. Councillor Sakala. Four. Councillor Crisati. Four. Councillor Davis. Four. Councillor Denny. Four. Mayor Ludwig. Four. Councillor Muller. Four. 
Just ten in favor, not against, and no abstentions. Item F under miscellaneous resolution waiving zoning application fee for 195 Elm Street. Where is a well, excuse me, 165 Elm Street? Good. All right, you're right. Sorry about that. 165 Elm Street. Where is accordance to Article 4 land use application fee section 66-94 zoning application fee schedule required a 300 plus surcharge filing fees and expenses for a petition for zone changes whereas the Enfield Town Council does authorize a waiver of said zoning application fees for 165 Elm Street submitted on September 21st 2018 by the town manager's office so moved. by Councillor Deputy Mayor Suzak by Councillor Muller and Chris I don't know real brief this is just he's resubmitting a plan that you know he right it's required. for a well-known project it was yeah. within a shorter time frame Lori has recommended he asked and legal says that you have the authority to do it and it's in the interest of getting this property you know enhanced and uh, encouraging businesses in the town yep. any questions yeah yeah exactly it says across them is Nuntuck. can you be a little more specific there I mean is that that's a strip plaza right across them where the uh, yes. comic book store is little, and the yep. strip malls my right? understanding. Yeah, there's not it's not a new development it's just the the development his been there that's been there Sorrento pizza Okay no I'll take this shake of the head thank you Yeah yep. got it I just want to be sure Any other questions? We done roll call please. Deputy Mayor Suzak. 4 Councilor Ungayer. 4 Councilor Arnoni. 4 Councilor Bosco. 4 Councilor Sakala. 4 Councillor Crisati. Four. Councillor Davis. Four. Councillor Denny. Four. Mayor Ludwig. Four. Councillor Muller. Four. There's ten in favor, none against, and no abstentions. So item G, I'll make sure I call on you first. Item G, resolution to adopt amendments of the Enfield Town Code, Chapter 38, Article 5, Sections 38-141 through Section 38-145 inclusive. Whereas the sections 38-141 through 38-145 inclusive of the town code govern the storage of interoperable and unregistered motor vehicles and whereas several town officials including the chief of police and a traffic safety officer have recommended amendments to the above reference sections of the ordinance and whereas the town council wishes to amend the ordinance in accordance with these recommendations <coughs> and whereas the town council held a public hearing in the Enfield Town Hall Council Chambers on October 1st 2018 to allow public input for the recommended amendments now therefore be it resolved the Enfield Town Council adopts the amendment recommended amendments to chapter 38 article 5 sections 38-141 through 38-145 inclusive of the town code code date prepared September 25th 2018 by the town attorney's office Vice Councilor Muller, seconded by Deputy Mayor Suzak. Up for discussion, Councilor Bosco. Okay, I, I, I was, well, first thing is, I would, like I was uh, saying, uh, people with side lots are really at a big disadvantage if they're in a the corner. Um, what I'd like to see in this is relief for people. And when I say relief, some type of permit that you file yearly you go down, you pay a fee, you file the VIN, you file the car. If we have to, we look at it, say, okay, this is where it's going to be. It's got to have a cover or maybe it just, you know, someone needs to put three walls up against their house with a fence just to make sure that it, it meets our zoning requirement. It now becomes taxable. It, it is something where someone says, hey, uh, there's a car parked here we can all we can honestly say without even wasting any time that car is a permit it met all the requirements it's all set you go you apply if you don't get the permit or someone thinks like that car uh, over at Gretchen's is not a viable car Th that by far is not a viable car but there's a lot of people that are enthusiasts uh, like I do and you know that you have a car and you may have a parts car that You need to fix the car that's inside your garage or you may be planning on getting it done And it's, it's a viable car and I you know This is the problem with the way the ordinance is is because if I have a car in my yard that is repairable that I you know classic or something that I want to restore these people are sort of put in the corner so I think the idea is to make people come in and have them come compliant and I think the way to compliant is with a permit and if you if you know if that person there on uh, Hazard Avenue says oh well I'm gonna restore this car if we ever get to the blight board 
they can make the final decision. Is this a car that really is viable or there is any value to repair it or even possibly to repair it? And that would take care of, I think, a lot of our problems on people that have things that they can repair or they're working on it. Uh, you know, so they, I think it would just give them types of people something that will meet our requirements. That's all we care about is they meet the requirements of the blight ordinance. It would allow them to have it. And um, I think it could be a win-win. It puts the car back on a tax roll. We get a yearly permit for it. And uh, if there's a complaint, we know that it either meets or it doesn't meet the requirements. And I think that would take care of a lot of our problems because I, I you know, out of all these, I usually vote no, blight and stuff, because nothing's really set in stone because every case is a little different. You know, like he was saying about the farms. Well, farms need these cars there because they, they do, you know, you know, you take Rafi, he uses them all for tobacco cars. But there's a way around that too is, you know, if you have a, a bona fide farm, you're, you're into PA 490. So if you don't have the PA 490, I'm sorry, you're, you're not a farm. You know, to have the PA 490, you have to meet certain requirements to show that you're a bona fide farm. So there's ways around some of this stuff that don't hurt the people that are really doing it legit. And it will take care of a lot of problems down the road and uh, let people be able to keep some of their stuff that they need. So that's just my opinion. And I think that if we could do anything to get things under control and work it out with the resident, I think that it's a win-win. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone yeah, else have any comments? Councilor Denny. Yeah, I think uh, I think if you permit car vehicles, make force people to permit somebody's abandoned, you call them abandoned, but they're really not abandoned because they're sitting in people's yards. I think if you force them to get a permit and pay, you will see some of these vehicles disappear uh, and get a junkyard or whatever to, to, to tow, them, tow them away rather than there. Because they're not paying any tax on them. They're not doing anything. They're just sitting. And they sit and sit and sit and nobody's doing anything about them. If you force them to remove these vehicles uh, or pay for them, you, you can have you can do whatever you want sitting right. in Right. What yard. you're doing is you're making them come into compliance. Correct. And that's what we want, compliance. <coughs> because they're, they're all over. And I think we ought to, we need to address in this uh, trailers and boats and whatever else that they're parking in their yards. Uh, no, this is the ordinance as it is right now. Thank you. Co Councilor Nunn. Uh, so what's that, what's so that? if everyone's done with comment, can we table this? Well, I'm not, I want a couple questions before yeah. I agree. Yeah, I'm not done. I, that's what I want to know when everyone's done. Yeah. Any other questions on this ordinance? So, I, before I, Chris, I just had a couple questions. So, I guess this, I hate to say this goes along with the, the, bright, the blight board that we've been talking about. So, I would like to, to Joey's point, I, I, I agree. We need to get, get this under control. But for me, I can't stand ordinances where A, it's really not enforceable. Or B, if we are enforcing it, there's not an appeal process. So I, I, to, I think to what Joey is saying that you know again there is that's what I think the blight board is meant to do. Uh, obviously we're thinking it from just a, from a housing perspective, but I also think it makes sense to what he what he's talking about. That's what I'd like to get to because again, I, I, I hear, everyone's right. I mean, if you live near that and you're in your area, it is very unsightly. I'm, you know, animals generally uh, you know unfortunately make them their new homes and. <laughs> And, and I'm just, I mean, again, the, it's always the people who are doing the right thing, always the ones who suffer. And so, and the other point to this, and I guess maybe this, if this is beyond our realm as a council, just tell me. Though in years past, Enfield's glorious history, we had a few car dealerships that had junkyards across the street and had some down on Route 5 where they had cars stacked a mile high. So again, does this ordinance even direct to, you know, so if, if we're going to go after a resident who has a car on their property, you know, what about some of the unsightly things we've had on Route 5 over the years, going back many, many years? I won't just mention any names, but I'm sure you can figure out who they are. You know, and, and again, it's almost like, again, we're going after certain people, but certain people we can't. 
So is there a way, I guess it's through the permitting process, maybe Joey mentioned, whether it be, you know, for, for a dealership, do they have to get a special permit to be able to, I'm assuming they have to, but I'm, again, I'm, I'm a novice at that. Where again, so we're not just going after the residents, we're making sure everyone's compliant. Not that we want to go after businesses either, but I mean, if we're going to tell a resident that they can't have a car in their property, and then a car dealership has 25 vehicles across the street that sit there for 25 years when kids used to play baseball behind the park, and everyone used to say every day, when are you going to clean up? When are you going to clean that up? When are you going to clean that up? So I guess that's my question, if that's in a nutshell. I think... I know, you know this doesn't address it, but does it? Do we no, get I mean I think this is a good time to look at it right. to see if it could, um, or if there's something else that does. I think it's timely since we're doing the changes to the blight board and we're bringing that up, and um, the town attorney's office has done a lot of work on that. It's ready for the subcommittee. This is a good time to look at this one, see where it interfaces on the appeal prospect, and we'll um, we're going to take all the comments from the public hearing, all the comments the council made. Uh, and then I think we'll put down for another meeting and advertise it so people, even more people may come forward with other ideas. And we have to understand we're never going to be able to address right. every situation like Councilor right. Bosco said. But we can do our best to, to, to make a common sense is, ordinance that will have a practical effect and make things so better. So does it make but, sense when we do the ordinance, when we go to vote on it? I mean, it would be great that this is something that really should be reviewed on a quarterly basis or maybe even on a six-month basis by if it's the Blight Board, whoever, whatever we decide to do this with. Because I think someone made a point. This really is continuous. There's always a unique aspect that can come up. I think once you, you have you know the I mean? blight board and they're hearing cases and meeting right. on a regular basis, then you're, it's going to be a natural uh, process where they'll say, we, we could amend this, we That's could tweak saying, this, right? we Instead could change it. Instead of just putting it on the books, then no, I, I, I think the fact that we it. don't have the blight board and you aren't constantly looking at it and we don't have a committee, I think that will satisfy it because they'll be meeting on a regular basis and they'll see where we need to make because improvements. Because I think it's important that we amend this, but I also want to make sure that we that we do a we're not going after the home or the vehicle owners who are doing the right thing a and then b but also giving it the teeth for the folks who aren't doing the right thing so again we're not penalizing the wrong group of people here that's what i always worry about some of this that we the, yeah right that's what i get worried about i just don't want to penalize the good people yeah one second so and so that's but so if sorry go ahead yeah uh, my question is, can we table this? Because it sounds like, you know, we're going to have another hearing and there's a lot more discussion on this. Yeah. So we, we don't uh, this, have to this, vote this. There was on nothing, this, right this only came about because the police said there's certain things that aren't viable in it. So uh, it was never meant to be done. You know, there was no emergency to do it. As Maria had said, we have an ordinance on the books. It'll stay there. And then we can look at it and address all the other uh, concerns that have come up and we can try to include them. And of course, we've got to make sure that they're enforceable. Joey's idea, I right. think, is a good one. We've got to, legal have to look at it and see if we can do that. Um, so. No, and, and again, it's great that the police brought this forward. It's what we should be talking yeah. about. So I mean, this is a good, this it's is complex. Exactly. I mean, it, it, it may sound simple on the face, but it isn't. You have the, you have zoning that comes into force. You have police. You have blight. You have unregistered cars. I mean, there are just a lot of different disciplines that come in that affect this in a lot of different ways. So first blush, you say, there's a car. Why can't you get rid of it? Well, you see, well, is it unregistered? Is it operable? I mean, is it unsightly? Well, to me, I think it's beautiful. It's a pile of junk to you. So, I mean, it's not an easy area. So you do the best you can, and then you pass it, and then... I think on a regular basis, you look at what comes up and you, you tweak it. Because you know, personally, I don't, I don't think it should be handled by the police. It should be handled by zoning, in my opinion. But sorry, go ahead. Deputy Mayor Suzak. I guess what I, what I really want to hear is if we pass this, do we now have something that's enforceable but still needs improvement? Is that what I'm hearing? We're not passing it tonight. Oh, no, you're not passing it tonight. You're tabling it. You're I mean, table. with all these concerns, uh, Don, I think it's, it's uh, well, these are then, so then substantive. we're going to now with nothing that. Yeah. Okay. All right. I'm going to just forward all the emails to everybody. Because, I mean, we really need to get to a point where we have some enforceability of um, unregistered vehicles, um, you know, piles of stuff in people's yards. We need to somehow get to that point. And it sounds to me like we have a lot more work to be done. It's not something that we're going to see in the next six months again, that we're going to get anything. But right now, I have a lot of residents that are saying to me, they're sick of listening to the fact that, eh, we've just suspended that because we can't enforce it. And well, I think there's two issues. I mean, I, I don't know if, if their concerns are addressed by the modifications being made. They, they really aren't. But, I, but what I'm hearing is at least I have something in hand that the police have brought to me that said that I don't have to listen to. It's now suspended because it's unenforceable. 
I guess that's what I'm hearing. But that's why we were council of 11. <laughs> Any other questions or comments? Uh, I'd let the town attorney refer to that because I, I think her opinion is that some parts won't be, but other parts still will be enforceable. But yeah, that that's a risky run. I don't know, you know, which, which parts will be and which parts won't. Perhaps she does. Well, I, I can't speak to all of it, to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. When you're talking about piles of junk in the yard, there are there are other blight ordinances that may address it. Right. I'm just there. You know, in terms of the enforceability of this particular ordinance as it stood, as I said, there were things that seemed to be an issue for the police. That doesn't mean the entire thing is not enforceable. And I take issue with the word that has been used, not so much by the council, but by some people, that it was so-called suspended. It was never suspended by the police, to my knowledge. That's not something that's within their power to do. Certainly, if there are things that are unenforceable, they're not going to enforce it. So in terms of what the town manager has said, I mean, there are so many areas here that you can leave what's on the books on the books and see what can be enforced rather than saying, you know, I, what I'm concerned about is that just because some parts might not be enforceable, that nothing is going to be looked at and then we are where we are. And people bring up some very good examples of things that need to be addressed. And I think rather than have it done in a piecemeal fashion, Consider all of your comments. I've made notes. We will, as our department, go over all the comments that have been made, see which ones really, I mean, some of them don't seem to me to be um, really a, a problem in terms of, I, I, I can't address which ones now, but as some of the comments were being made, it seemed to me that they were addressed by the existing ordinance. So rather than do something piecemeal, you might want to wait and do everything comprehensively, as has been said. I mean, something as far as junkyards that the mayor has mentioned, those are absolutely illegal. Something in terms of businesses and zoning, that's covered by zoning. As Chris said, there are the zoning permit pieces, the property maintenance piece, the motor vehicle piece. It's a complicated area. And I think it's, it's one that has come to light because of one particular area, and now it's morphed where people are seeing other areas. So, I mean, it's obviously up to the council how it wants to proceed. Was, I wasn't trying to muddy things, no, but there are just uh, a, lot of, a, a lot of different Appreciate tentacles in there. I mean, so folks, I mean, so the, really the discussion is move forward with the, the amendment and then make it more robust, or do we wait and make it all robust at, robust at once? Yeah. Um, that's why I was just waiting for comment to close. Yeah, go ahead. You know, I was waiting for comment to close to ask if they yeah. want, if they wanted to table. Anyone else have any comments? I mean, personally, I'm okay with voting on what we have here, and then putting me a robust. But if folks don't agree, that's fine as well. So we'll have when we do this, we'll have a motion to table, yeah. and then we'll take a, a hand a hand vote. Yeah. So it's by roll call the table. Yeah, I have to. I'll make the motion. Right, motion by Councillor Arnone. Second. Second by Councillor uh, Ungar. Any discussion on the motion to table? And so, real quick, this will be so Marie not to put you on a spot. When will the next public hearing be ready? To Donna, to Deputy Mayor Suzak. So it's not going to be six months. I mean, we, no, but we should at least get a copy so we can. No, read it. no, I know. But my so my point is, when do you think we can add this six? Is it the no, first November meeting or? I think what I'd like to do is, and certainly in consultation with the town manager, but once we put together all the comments that have been made, whether it's you as an entire council or a subcommittee, to say, okay, yeah, this is what we want. I mean, there are some things that are conflicting in terms of some of the public's interests, so that's really going to be up to you. We don't want to have things that are ultimately kind right. of we're back in the same spot. So whether it's presented to a subcommittee or to the manager, I don't know if the town manager has a recommendation there, but. Um, uh, since this has been to the council, I'd rather have this come back to a public Yeah, hearing. what I would say, it's, it's on our agenda, yeah. so it'll be, we'll be reminded it's tabled. And then given her workload, she'll get all of the comments together, be able to meet with um, Sergeant Meyer again, work out the language, which will take some time to find out which ideas are legal, then put it into the, the language, then we would get it all to you. And I think, again, um, share your thoughts on it before we're ready to go. And if it looks good at that juncture, then we could set it for another public hearing, the newly revised, and have it on for action 
uh, at that meeting as well. Okay. But I think we kind of want to give it all to you, vet it very well so we don't come back, and then there's four or five other uh, ideations that people want to see addressed in it, um, and then start from scratch. So I think we'll take all of the um, ideas we heard tonight from the public and from the council, and she can turn it into um, l ordinance language with Sergeant Meyer, and then we'll get it back to you. Okay. And I don't want to speak for her. I would think she'd be able to have that done, you know, in November. Okay. Yeah, I think I think that's fair. But I think, too, to the point that was raised by Councillor Bosco about your blight review committee, I mean, that's something that at this point doesn't <clears throat> exist. If you want, and we were looking at that primarily with the property maintenance ordinance to have that a component of um, kind of some sort of mini appellate review. If you want that to be as part of this as well, I mean, it doesn't exist yet. So I'm not trying to say, okay, put it off some more. But remember that that's one of your comments. You want to have some means of review for people. Well, and that's my point. You know, at least one person telling you you have to do something is not fair. You get six or seven, at least you have a chance. To, to, and, and that's why I think it should be tied with the blade. And I think that I don't, I don't know how far you guys are, but it's been something that I've been trying to push for seven years. Yeah, she's done basically the um, some proposed language about the composition of the committee and what they will review. And then she can look in regard to this area. Some of these things aren't going to be reviewable right. by you. Some things you're going to have to take or you'll never get anything done. Some things about your permit to that point. Some uh, elements that we think would be appropriate for the blight review, she can then this is a good time because we can say right in this rewrite that those things could be reviewed by blight review. So I leave it to her discretion to find out what areas you should look at and which areas you can't statutorily. But this is a good time because we're putting that down for the subcommittee. She's already done the language on the blight review committee, the proposed composition and the, and the policy of it. So it's good to include this too in areas that can be reviewed by you. Some won't be, some won't be. All right, so, so, all right, so we, Let's move on. I mean, yep. I'll have to say that. It's coming to the subcommittee, yeah. and then it will come to the council if you, you all say that it's the policy you like. Thank you. Uh, any other discussion? If not, roll call to table. Deputy Mayor Suzak. No. Councillor Unglier. Yes. Councillor Arnone. Yes. Councillor Bosco. Four. Councillor Sakala. Four. Councillor Crisati. Four. Councillor Davis. Four. Councillor Denny. Four. Mayor Ludwig. Against. And Councillor Muller. Four. We have eight in favor and two against. No abstentions. Item H, uh, under miscellaneous resolution authorizing the town manager to enter in a contract for services for Randy Daigle, resolve that Christopher W. Bronson, town manager, is authorized to execute a contract for services with Randy Daigle to act as a liaison for the town of for the town and for the Enfield School, Enfield High School consolidation project, subject to review and approval of, of the town attorney, presented by the town manager's office on September 26, 2018, <coughs> by by Councillor Muller, second by Councillor Davis. Any discussion on the resolution? I know, Chris. Real, real quick, is just a follow up for the resolution. Yeah, it is the the. the, the Committee's being resolved or dissolved, but we need somebody who has legal authority to go before the state to try to tie up these issues and get final um, resolution to the um, project. After meeting with John Wilcox and our uh, consultant, uh, Chris Cycli, this has been done in past committees. It's being paid for by the, the funds that are appropriated already by the state. So there are strict limits to it. There's you know only so much a month that can be spent for a total of not over about $5,000, which is in line with what in the past um, has been needed to resolve the issue. But we need somebody with ex expertise. We don't want to fumble when we're just about across the, you know, I'm going to make the touch down so we want to make sure we get all the reimbursements we're entitled to and we need somebody who has experience of Randy who's been on the committee and can uh, work in um, concert with John and Chris Cycli to get the job finished um, just a comment and I apologize for not catching this earlier so number four references one a and B and I believe it should reference two a and B so you're gonna need to change four It says the total amount paid shall not exceed 4,800 as reference or the, for the services described in 1A and B. There is no 1A and B. I'm assuming it means 2A and B. Uh, John will have to answer because he wrote it. Okay. John, you might have. I'm just saying, in, so, do well, you have a copy of the contract? Yeah. 
actually didn't pay it. It was uh, they kind of. Okay. Well, the contract in and of itself is fine. The The content is fine. What I'm saying is four references. I, I think that's an amendment. I agree. Yeah, I agree. It just needs to yeah. be changed. I don't care so, how you're going to change it. You just need to change it. Change one to two. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm, it should be referencing two A and B. And if I had caught it before, I would have emailed you, so I apologize. Uh, what Susanna says, you're authorizing me to sign the contract. You're not authorizing every language in the contract. So with that proviso subject to the town attorney's review, she'll make the change. And once she makes sure it's copastatic, I'll sign it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. No further discussion. Roll call, please. Deputy Mayor Suzak. Four. Councillor Ungeyer. Four. Councillor Arnone. Four. Councillor Bosco. Four. Councillor Sakala. Four. Councillor Crisati. Four. Councillor Davis. Four. Councillor Denny. Four. Mayor Ludwig. Four. Councillor Muller. Four. There's ten in favor, none against, and no abstentions. Item 16, public communications. Does anyone like to speak for the council? Lucian. Welcome, sir. Lucian Lafay, 54 Kimberly Drive, also uh, American Legion Post 154 Commander and a member of the Town Veterans Council. Going into the stores, I, I was thinking it might be early, but it's not. You go into the stores, they got Christmas trees out already. I'm putting, a, for everybody watching and the people here, a save the date. November 11th on a Sunday, Veterans Day Parade and the festivities at the park, the dedication of the uh, wreath laying. The most important, to me, it's the most important part of the whole operation. The parade is nice for the kids and everything, but that's the important part. It actually falls on Veterans Day this year, which makes it even more near and dear to my heart. So for the people out there, save the date. On another note, this is the time of year where all the veterans organizations are out there fundraising. I encourage people to be generous with them, but on another note, make sure that they're viable organizations that you're donating to. Anybody that's out there collecting for veterans, that is a nonprofit at the very least, if you ask them, should be able to produce a copy of their nonprofit status with the IRS. If they're doing a raffle in conjunction with it to, to raise money, they should have in hand a copy of their state permit, their nonprofit status, and I send my people out with it, a copy of our insurance liability to cover us when we're out there. So I encourage people to be generous, but make sure they're donating to the right causes. I mean, the American Legion, VFW, uh, DAV, they're, they're notable organizations. There should be no question. They should be able to produce any of the documentation you ask them for. So again, save that date, November 11th. We expect to see a lot of people at that parade, and hopefully the streets are lined when we march down to the town green. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. No, no, it's like speak for the council. Jack. Let me sit too long. Can't move. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I shouldn't have climbed up that. <laughs> Jack Sheridan, 7 Buchanan Road. Um, first of all, I take issue with what Joey said before about the referendum and from 2015. Uh, the Board of Ed in our audit we knew that the Board of Ed had millions of dollars every year that were to go toward maintenance and upkeep. Whether it actually got spent on maintenance, we know it didn't. So they fell behind in, in the repairs and maintenance, even in the fields, because of that. The money was allocated for things other than what it was supposed to be. And once it failed, in the referendum for many other reasons. They had just passed a lot of other things, just like now. The, the big thing was that uh, it could have been funded in other ways. Didn't, didn't, didn't need to be funded all at once through a referendum. So that, that's things in the past, that's what happens. If it doesn't fail, it's like when they changed all the light bulbs in Barnard, I think it was Barnard, they went through, uh, you went through uh, 
Simmons, and they messed the whole deal up because they put, but that was done without a referendum. So, thank you. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Anyone else like to speak for the council? Bob? Bob T. Katz, Woodgate Circle. I think it was around 2008, the committee that Jack was on, and I was on it too, we turned over the maintenance to the town council. <coughs> and after that, the school board made a resolution that all excess money would be put toward maintenance. Of course, we don't know what happened to that because nobody ever followed up on what where that money went. In 1990, which I'm going through right now, <clears throat> the, the school board wanted 11% increase in, in their uh, budget. And of course, uh, the town council uh, kicked it back and the school board was uh, moaning and groaning. They had to l lay off 31 teachers and, the, and, and they got their money. But you know what happened? They didn't lay off 31 teachers, they hired teachers. So their budget was bogus, <clears throat> and nobody ever, nobody ever uh, on the town council picked up on it. And right now, our administration in the school system is the 30th highest amount of money being spent in the state of Connecticut. As far as the, the money for the children, we're about 160th. We're near the bottom of the list. So we're overstaffed in administration in the school system. When they closed Fermi, they moved all of all the administration over. They didn't lay anybody off. So, and they didn't lay any teachers off. Last year, when they closed Nathan Hale, all they did was move the teachers over to the, to the other schools. They didn't lay any teachers off. They had the same amount of teachers. So your class size went down to 19. So that's where a lot of the money's being spent. And uh, that's a tragedy that we don't, we don't look at that school budget and really cut their budget so so they can live within their means. You have to do it on the town side, but we you don't force them to do it on the school board side. And you, and as far as Ansonia with the money that they loaned to the school board, the state says they didn't have to give them the money, but the state department of education says yes. So they haven't given them the money, and they they showed them that they paved the parking lots with that money that they said they didn't have. So somebody's not telling the truth on the school board side, we, and we should have a, a citizen's audit committee to, to look at it again because we're spending too much money on the school system. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Anyone else like to speak for the council? Hearing none, I declare public communications closed. Councilor Communications, Councilman Bosco. Just to clarify, Jack. I, I, I agree with you to a point. When, when I, well, I guess the point I was getting across was um, in the past, when we first took over, uh, and, and as you would know, they, the school board told us that they needed oil to heat the building, and we gave them oil, and all the tanks were full, and they were paying 35 cents a gallon to store it. But my point of reading the, um, the referendum over and over is we had a whole group of people and we still do that say that we never did any repairs to the building the problem is with our hands tied at the six hundred thousand dollar range there were a lot of repairs we couldn't do you know just like half of a roof or something so um we really now, now there's an avenue to do it. I don't know why we couldn't do it before, but now we have an avenue to get some of that, that work done. But our hands were tied on any big project to $600,000. And because of that, we couldn't do a lot of things that we would have liked to have done, even a little at a time. Uh, $600,000 with prevailing wage and everything else isn't very much work nowadays. So, uh, you know, that, that just... I know where you're coming from, but I just want to let you know why I said what I said. And uh, like Bob, man, well, we had the full oil tanks, and we paid them every year to fix the building, and it didn't happen. But the, the, the way it's set up now, we don't have that problem anymore. Thank you. Councilor Sakala. 
Thank you. I did forget to mention that this coming Saturday is the um, Outrun Addiction 5K here in Enfield. Um, so it is at 9 a.m. Enfield Street School, and um, I'm going to be running it. So if anybody else wants to come and run, they should. And 100% of the proceeds goes to CAP and Alex's Army. So really good, worthwhile causes. And hopefully it's nice weather. Go out and get some exercise. Come run a 5K with us. All right. Thanks. Thank you. <coughs> Motion to adjourn? No. Uh -oh. Go. 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 Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. I I just like to mention um, from our Crisati family. Uh, thank you to everyone that expressed their sympathy and condolences uh, to my uncle uh, Richard Crisati who passed away this past week, uh, former con councilman and former state representative. I just wanted to mention it because Enfield uh, missed a, uh, is going to lose a good man. So I just want to say thank you from our family. Do I have a motion to adjourn? Motion. By Councilor Denny, second by Councilor Sakal. Those in favor by a show of hands. Those opposed, those abstentions, 10 in favor, zero against. <laughs>